our public hearings tonight. Uh, welcome everybody who came out for either item 33 or 34. Um, I would imagine most everybody's here for the latter. Uh, but we have a, for an item, uh, item 33, it's a resolution supplementing fiscal year 2021 budget. Um, Kat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Agenda item number 33 is a proposed resolution supplementing the fiscal year 2021 budget for unanticipated fund balances in the general fund, emergency medical services, emergency communications E911, fire districts, fleet management, water renewal and replacement, and sewer renewal and replacement funds. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay, thank you, Kat. I didn't see any uh, messages coming in. So uh, are there um, any questions on this item by any of the commissioners? No? Okay, do I have a motion? Move approval, Mr. Chair. Oh, um, yeah. A motion by Commissioner uh, Long and second by Commissioner Gerard. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, move on to item 34. Kat, get us started, please. Agenda item number 34 is case number Z-LU-14-09-19. This is a request from TTGC LLC for a future land use map amendment from recreation open space and preservation to residential low and preservation on approximately 95.96 acres located at 11832 66th Avenue North in unincorporated Seminole. This is the first public hearing on this matter. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Approximately 696 letters, emails, and phone calls, 794 postcards, two written petitions, one with 19,188 signatures and one with 168 signatures, and an online petition with 2,688 names have been received, all in opposition. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay, thank you, Kat. Um, and we'll move to Jewel. She has some opening comments about the, uh, the hearing tonight. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as our board uh, uh, clerk here has indicated, uh, the application before you this evening is to amend the future land use designation on the property from recreation open space and preservation to residential low and preservation. You have included as part of your record the LPA report that in addition to the land use also addressed a requested zoning change, development agreement, and development master plan. However, those matters are not before you this evening. Because of the size of the subject property, it requires two public hearings on the requested land use amendment, and this is the first of those two hearings. The second hearing on the land use amendment which will also include the zoning development agreement and development master plan is tentatively scheduled for later this fall. So your vote this evening is whether to transmit the proposed amendment to the state of Florida in accordance with state statute for further review under specific state criteria as set forth in section 163.3184. So your action this evening is a legislative determination as to whether or not you determine the case before you and the proposed amendment is consistent with the county's comprehensive plan. Again, to be clear, your action tonight is legislative in nature. The basis by which uh, cases of this nature should be judged is the rational basis standard meaning your decision must be rationally related to a legitimate government interest. And again, to reiterate, your decision should be whether or not the proposed amendment is consistent with your county comprehensive plan. So on some of the procedural issues for the conduct of the hearing uh, this evening, this is not a quasi-judicial proceeding, but your ordinance that governs the conduct of quasi-judicial proceedings does contemplate its use for legislative proceedings as well. And this board has for quite some time adhered to that process, which is set forth in section 134-14 of your land development code. 
Again, we ha uh, this board has long used that process for its legislative hearings as well. Uh, but to be clear, using the process uh, for your quasi-judicial hearings does not make this a quasi-judicial proceeding. It remains a legislative proceeding. So the order of presentation set forth in your ordinance provides that the initial presentation will be done by county staff. You will then hear from the applicant. Then you will hear from proponents, opponents, and then there will be rebuttal by the parties to this proceeding, which would be the applicant or county staff, uh, any inquiry by the members of the county commission, of course, and then we will close the public hearing. Uh, you all will recall that you have already addressed a procedural issue related to this hearing at your May 11th county commission meeting. At that time, you voted to allow the two parties to this proceeding county staff and the applicant, 45 minutes each to present their case, inclusive of rebuttal. All other participants in the hearing process will be bound by the time frames set forth in your ordinance. That is up to three minutes for any proponent or opponent, or up to 10 minutes for representatives of a group of five or more persons where four of those persons who are either present in the room or virtually have yielded their time to the group representative. And I know that the clerk can, can tell us how many folks that we have uh, registered. But one last item to mention, your record. You have quite a number of items included in your record uh, this evening. And what you will see in there are all those items that were received seven days in advance of this hearing, which is again pursuant to the terms of your ordinance, uh, as well as all the correspondence. Uh, so with that, I will ask if anybody has any questions. Any questions for Jewel? Okay, thank you. All right. So we begin. Barry, um, get us get us going here. And uh, I think we have staff first, correct? Yep, staff is up. So Glenn Bailey and Scott um, can come forward to begin. Mr. Chair. Yes, Commissioner Long. Uh, Barry. Good, good evening, Glenn. Um, could you ask the staff please to refer occasionally to whatever document and or page they're on? as we go through the presentations. It's enormously helpful. Yes, we will. Especially doing everything electronically. <laughs> Thank you. This is presentation. This is actually item number five in your, in your record. Um, good evening, I'm Glenn Bailey, zoning manager with the Department of Housing and Community Development. I'm a certified professional planner with 20 years of experience. I'm gonna give an overview of the request before you tonight and then turn it over to Scott Swearingen, long range planning manager who will discuss a comprehensive plan relative to this case. Uh, we also have subject matter experts on hand to answer questions, including Lisa Foster, floodplain administrator, and Joe Boris, emergency management, among others. All right. Here's the subject property in this case is approximately 95.96 acres located in the unincorporated Seminole area. Existing use on the property uh, site is currently vacant. It is the former location of the Tides Golf Course. And the application request before you tonight is a future land use map amendment from recreation, open space, and preservation to residential low and approximately 89 acres and preservation approximately seven acres. You see a chart on your right shows the various steps in the large scale land use change process. The request has already been before the Development Review Committee and Land Local Planning Agency. We are at step four, the transmittal hearing. If denied, the application stops here. If transmitted to state agency review and countywide planning process managed by Fort Pinellas would occur simultaneously. That's steps six and seven on the chart. And the second BCC public hearing would follow the conclusion of those, those processes. That's step eight on your chart. Here we see the location map for the uh, subject property. You can see the amendment area in red. Uh, the main site access is off 66 Avenue North on the north side of the subject property. To the north and east are residential subdivisions that predate the current comprehensive plan and zoning regulations. To the north and east. And to the south is Boca Siega Bay and to the uh, west is Boca Siega Millennium Park. Here 
Here's another aerial perspective of the general area. You can clearly see the property's coastal location along Boca Siega Bay and the barrier islands uh, in the background. The property's elevation rises from north to south with the highest point of approximately 27 feet on the northeast corner near where the former clubhouse was. So the property does sea level here and it slopes up, up to about 27 feet in the northeast corner. We see the request, the existing future land use and the proposed future land use, the existing on the left, proposed on the right. As proposed, the residential low land use would essentially replace the current extent of the recreation open space land use. Uh, the preservation area is the same except the removal of the drainage feature on the north end of the property. On uh, submerged lands, importantly, the parcel actually goes out into the, uh, the bay, but the submerged lands and the, uh, the islands out there are not part of this application. Here's some site history. This was also explained in um, item one in your record, the, staff, the LPA staff report. In 1926, it was platted for 273 lots as part of Seminole Estates, which is about 30 years prior to the first zoning code in the county. In 1969, a special exception was granted by the Board of Adjustment that allowed the golf course and the residential zoning districts that were on the property at the time. In 1973, the clubhouse was built and the golf course opened. 1975, we first see the recreation open space land use placed on the subject property. You see that in that map in the, the corner, the, the bottom right corner. It's for the first time, it was put on the property in 1975, um, the future land use map, it was residential in the first future land use map, which dated from 1973. In 1980, 1985, it was rezoned to uh, agricultural estate in the uplands and aquatic lands, submerged lands and islands. AE was the appropriate zoning district to pair with recreation open space at that time. The county did not have recreation zoning districts until 2009. And in fact, the majority of Boca Ciega Millennial Park to the west uh, is still zoned residential agriculture, so it has the same zoning as this property and the same recreation open space land use covering it, so they are compatible. In 1992, the 1926 residential plat was vacated at the owner's request. The plat has not existed for 29 years now. In 2013, there was a separate application to propose 170 residential units. The case was withdrawn prior to the LPA public hearing following the release of staff denial recommendation. And in 2018, the golf course closed. The special exception approving the golf course expired uh, per code uh, six months later. Uh, the current land use and recreation open space, the allowed uses are public, private open space and parks, public recreation facility, public beach, water access, golf course, clubhouse. And the locational characteristics is, is basically appropriate for public and private open spaces and recreational facilities wherever they may exist throughout the county. And this is language from the Pinellas County Comprehensive Plans, Future Land Use Map Categories, Descriptions and Rules. So this is adopted policy. And for the proposed residential low land use, it's allowed uses of residential up to five units per acre, institutional, transportation, utility, recreation, open space. Locational characteristics is generally appropriate to locations between major employment centers and shopping centers, where use and development characteristics are low density residential, serving as a transition between suburban and urban areas and within a 100 year floodplain, where preservation or recreation open space are not feasible. And much of the area proposed for residential low in this case is within the 100 year floodplain, which Scott will later discuss further as it relates to the comprehensive plan. And again, this is language, adopted language in the comprehensive plan. Existing development rights on the property to recreation open space land use category allows the recreation open space use as I mentioned. It does not provide any residential density, regardless of what zoning district is in place and regardless of any previous residential plats that might have been on the property, that were on the property. Now, the RA zoning district residential agriculture allows residential lots with a minimum lot size of two acres. However, it must be supported by the underlying future land use. In this case, it does not. Residential agriculture zoning district does allow golf courses and accessory uses with type two use approval or formerly known as a special exception. And the golf course could be reinstated is still allowable by the record open, open space land use and type two use approval uh, in the RA zoning district. And now we'll hand the presentation over to Scott Swergen, long range planning manager.
Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the board, it's a pleasure to be before you this evening, and I do appreciate your time. My name is Scott Swearingen, and I am the county's long-range planning manager. I am also certified by the American Institute of Certified Planners, and I have a little bit over 20 years of experience, a little bit more than Glenn, I would say. <laughs> uh, prior to coming to the county, I actually worked in the private sector where I worked for both public agencies like counties and cities, and I also worked for private clients, mostly developers and large uh, land trusts, working on cases similar to this, rezonings and the like. So I'm glad to have um, in my midterm career a broad amount of experience um, in the field of planning. My group is primarily responsible for the county's comprehensive plan. We're often referred to as the stewards of the comprehensive plan because we are the ones who primarily, we craft policy, we update policy, goals, objectives as well. Uh, we update our data and analysis that supports, that's really the foundation for our goals, objectives, and policies. And we work with other departments throughout the county to help them craft language and policy language that can support their own initiatives, their own programs, and the projects that they'd like to pursue um, into the future. And the other responsibility that we have is that we review land use map amendments and comprehensive plan amendments, and we do this from a holistic point of view with specific emphasis on maintaining a balanced approach between the elements. As the name implies, our comprehensive plan is indeed comprehensive. We have 12 elements in the plan, most of which are shown up on the slide before you. And it's important that when we're reviewing projects like this, that we really do look across elements to see what type of goals, objectives, and policies apply to a particular application for a particular subject property. And that, that we have done, and as noted in your staff report, and which I'll get into in just a moment as I move along. Where we begin in such a review, as Mr. Bailey mentioned, the current future land use on the property is recreation open space. That is a designation for a little over 90% of the, of the 96 acre subject property. And so that's really the foundation that we start with. That's when we review uh, these applications. What are the permitted uses currently? What are the density and um, limitations on the property? What are perhaps non-residential floor area ratios and non-residential intensities that are permitted? And that really kind of sets the foundation. So from that point, we use that as the basis to then look at, okay, now what is being proposed? And what is that delta in there between what's currently there and what is proposed? What, is, what, are, the, what are the impacts within that delta? And we use that information and we use that change, that amount of change, when we go through the various elements and reviewing those goals, objectives, and policies. We often refer to ourselves, and others as well, refer to us, Pinellas County, as a peninsula on a peninsula. We're mostly surrounded by water, we're low lime, and we're quite vulnerable to major storm events, um, usually about half the year, every year. Uh, we have that risk, and uh, sometimes you know, they come through, and, and we're reminded of this vulnerability that we have. And so it's, it won't be a surprise, I think, hardly anybody, that our comprehensive plan requires, on balance, that the county restrict and direct development away from those vulnerable areas. It's a major theme of our comprehensive plan, and you can see that theme throughout the elements, throughout the goals, objectives, and policies throughout the plan. And so I think that's something very important to note as we launch off um, into this review, that our comp plan requires that the county restrict and direct development away from vulnerable areas. <clears throat> now, the application, the proposal before us, staff finds that it, that it does not do that. The proposal places residential development vis-a-vis -vis a residential designation over 89 acres of the property, ju just over 90% of the property, and within areas of high vulnerability where currently no residential entitlements exist. And some of those areas of high vulnerability 
on the subject property include floodplain area, coastal storm area, storm surge areas, and areas subject to potential sea level rise in the future. And I'm going to go through all of these. We're going to talk, I'm going to, to speak to all four of these areas of high vulnerability. I'm going to get into a little bit of what does our comp plan say for each of these. And then we'll look at a map and see how these areas overlay on the property and how they're applied and how they could be impacted based on the proposal before you. Mr. Bailey had mentioned that we do have um, staff uh, subject ac experts in the room today and available if you should have any detailed questions. Uh, we have people that can help, such as um, I recognize Lisa Foster, our floodplain administrator, Joe Boris from emergency management. We also have others that can speak to transportation uh, as well as archaeology. So we have people here to help us through this should you have any detailed questions either as we go or, or after the presentation. And then I will finally note uh, for the commission that the maps that I'm about to go through, the map series, is attachment number two in your packet. So if you want to go directly to them and not look at them in the presentation. <clears throat> so to set this up, we're looking at a, residential, uh, a request for residential low across 89 acres of the 96 acre property. And this future land use category within our comp plan, our comp plan identifies locational criteria and it describes this category as being appropriate in areas within a 100 year floodplain only where preservation and recreation open space uses are not feasible. The current land use again is recreation open space and it has been like that for 46 years now. Up to 2018 and since 1973, there has been a recreation use on the property as the golf course and the golf course clubhouse. Now this is important, this is very important to us because the retention of open space in vulnerable areas, it provides environmental and storm related mitigation value. This is how we can help prepare for and respond to and deal with those vulnerabilities that we have throughout our county. And so then we look for de development when it's proposed that could be directed to other less vulnerable areas. With regard to vulnerability to the floodplains, our comp plan seeks to protect floodplains. In fact, goal six of our natural resource conservation and management element, it directs the county to protect floodplains in order to minimize adverse impacts on the natural systems public safety and investments such as infrastructure and such as housing. The map on your right is our 100 year FEMA floodplain map. The area in the green is located within the 100 year floodplain. This is high risk area in the green. And let me use the pointer, <laughs> um, not sure which map to go to. I will just go to this one here so I can sort of, this is that floodplain map. It's superimposed over the subject property and it's kind of hard to see the southern end of the subject property, but if you follow the pointer, you can start to make it out. So as we can see, um, approximately two thirds of the project is within the 100 year floodplain, this high risk area. And then most of the balance of that subject property is within low to moderate risk area that's outside of the 100 year floodplain. And as mentioned, our comprehensive plan directs, guides us and encourages us to not, to not build in a floodplain and look for other areas of lower risk. Moving on to our coastal storm area. Our comprehensive plan restricts development with our coastal storm area. Objective 1.3 of our coastal management element restricts development within and directs population concentrations out of the coastal storm area. And then policy 1.3.5 of that same element, it prohibits land use amendments within the CSA, the coastal storm area, that would result in more than five dwelling units per acre. I think it's good to pause there for a second. What that is not saying is that development is permitted and development is okay as long as you're no more than five dwelling units per acre. This doesn't mean that, that requests um, at or below this threshold are always appropriate and that they'll, they'll just simply be granted. 
they have to be weighed and balanced against the other plan policies and directives and the other features of the subject property that, this, that the amendment is applying to. And the map on your right shows our coastal storm area. The area in the green is the area within our coastal high hazard area and our coastal storm area. It's an area that's subject to storm surge from a category one hurricane. And our comprehensive plan states that if greater than 20% of a parcel is within this green area, that the entire parcel is considered to be within the coastal storm area. Therefore, based on our adopted comp plan policy, the entire parcel is considered to be within the coastal storm area. But we can see based on that map, those areas of higher, of higher vulnerability that are in the green, and we can start to see a pattern developing as well as we look at these vulnerable areas. Primarily, they're located to the south and to the southwest on that subject property. Moving on to our vulnerability is storm surge. The map on your right shows uh, storm surge potential for a category one uh, hurricane. And that area in the darker blue toward along near the shoreline of the subject property, that's area that would be subject to storm surge of up to three feet. And this isn't a category one storm. And we can see how much of that subject property is covered with in those with, within that, um, that coverage for storm surge. And this is on a category one storm. So if we look at a category three storm, we can see that over two thirds of the subject property is impacted or could be impacted by a category three storm surge. And that area to the far south, the deeper purple near the coastline, that's a, that area is potential to be 15 feet of storm surge in that area. Excuse me. Finally, with regard to the vulnerabilities of sea level rise, our comp plan recognizes that planning for sea level rise is important to long-term viability and sustainability. Our coastal management element, objective 4.6, directs the county to remain apprised of and to plan for rising sea levels. This is our adopted plan, what it's guiding us to do. And then finally, on the map to the right, we have superimposed sea level rise data over the subject property. And what the projections show is that much of the southern portion of the subject property is, is affected by sea level rise in the coming decades. And this is important as well because what this also does is that it exacerbates storm surge impacts. With rising seas, your storm surge impacts go higher as well. So over the years, we can also expect, um, in, our, in relation to this, higher storm surge levels. <clears throat> I'm gonna speak quickly to our recreation, open space, and cultural resources element of the comp plan. Objective 1.4, the county will protect its open spaces and scenic vistas for their contributions to quality of life. And policy 143 under that objective is that we will, the county will encourage and incentivize the retention and reestablishment of open vistas where appropriate with particular emphasis on coastal areas, lands surrounding parks, and environmental lands. Coastal areas, lands surrounding parks, and environmental lands. Back to the oblique aerial, you can see the subject property. Uh, this is north lurking south. And we have adjacent, directly adjacent to the subject property, we have recreation areas. We have Boca Ciega Millennium Park, our county park. We have coastal area at the south end. And we have environmentally sensitive areas with the Boca Ciega Bay off to the south and to the west. So all three, and it's not just one of those that applies in this case, it's actually all three of those issues. And then finally, also remaining in, staying within the recreation open space and cultural resources element of our comp plan, objective 1-5, in recognition of the limited amount of open, available open space remaining within the county, Pinellas, Pinellas County shall prohibit the conversion of dedicated recreation open land uses and encourage the retention of non-dedicated recreation open space land uses. Now, dedicated open recreation open space uses are uses there like our parks. So those are the public 
publicly held um, recreation open spaces, and then non-dedicated are things such as golf courses. And so our comp plan encourages us, encourages the, the retention of non-dedicated recreation open space land uses. And again, the future land use of the property is indeed open space and is recreation and open space for the last 46 years. So as I close, we recommend a denial of this current application based upon inconsistencies with the comprehensive plan. The residential low land use that is being proposed, this application request substantially encroaches into and is reliant upon development within vulnerable areas. The comprehensive plan limits and directs residential development out of such areas. We just went through the whole map series and related it to the policies as well that they apply to. And what we can see is that of the over 90% of the subject property that is, that is being proposed for res a residential designation, this is encroaching well into the most vulnerable areas of the subject property. And so for staff, it's difficult to support the introduction of population density into the vulnerable coastal area where residential development hasn't been allowed under the ROS designation for 46 years. And of course, as we, as we went through, we know what kind of impacts we can have when we start to encroach into these, these vulnerable areas. Impacts on infrastructure investments, on utilities, on roadways, hurricane evacuation, property, and in our own population as well. And again, the retention of open space in the vulnerable area, it's important as it provides intrinsic value for environmental and storm mitigation purposes in a nearly built out county like Pinellas where such resources are scarce. These are scarce resources for us right now. We're at that point. Therefore, the current, we find, staff finds that the current application, which includes the requested land use amendment, is inappropriate as it on balance is inconsistent with the Pinellas County Comprehensive Plan. Therefore, staff recommends denial of the future land use map application before you this, this evening. Our local planning agency heard this case last month on April 6th, and they recommended denial unanimously with a 6-0 vote. So moving forward, as our county attorney mentioned, it's um, when we get to that point um, in this hearing, it's a decision whether to whether this is appropriate to transmit to the state to go through their review process under their statutory requirements. Um, if that occurs, then this would also go to the county planning authority for Pinellas and it would run through its public hearing course and review course with them as well before it would come back to this board for a second public hearing. And if you decide that it is not appropriate to transmit this to the state, then the land use amendment is thus denied and it does not move forward. That is all I have for you. I really appreciate your time and I hope um, that was informative. Um, I'm, I'm here to try and respond to questions or I can direct questions to others unless you want to move forward with the applicant's presentation. Okay. Thank you. All right, we'll stop the time. You have about 19 minutes and 10 seconds left on the final rebuttal. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, are there any quick questions or let's move on to the present, the second president. Do you have a question? Well, just out of curiosity, because it's one of my passions and initiatives on this county commission, I did not hear you make any reference or maybe you did and I was looking at maps or whatever, but I didn't hear you make any th thoughts or recommendations about the ingress and egress mm -hmm. around that community and how that would all take place. I'm just curious mm -hmm. about that. I understand that probably doesn't comport with the issue of the land use, but surely it comes into play just, you know, when you think it through or if you're familiar with that area at all. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, and I appreciate the question. It, it, it is a part of the review and in your staff report, um, there is, there's the review and analysis uh, to that regard. 
Um, I didn't. I didn't pull the kitchen sink out for for okay, a presentation, <laughs> but we do have subject matter experts here as well that can that can help unpack that. In addition to those comprehensive plan, that comprehensive plan consistency re review that I just went through. Good to know. And Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Ms. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry about that confusion. It's applicant um, presentation at this point, Joel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, commissioners, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joel Tu. I am the applicant's land use attorney. Uh, I have practiced land use and zoning law for 41 years, uh, I hate to say, uh, in Pinellas County and greater Tampa Bay. It's a pleasure being here this evening. I have the privilege of representing the owners of the land and the project known as Restoration Bay, which is the subject of the county required process for a combined application for a zoning change from RA to RPD with the development master plan and an FLU map amendment from recreation open space to residential low with the development agreement limiting density to 273 single family dwelling units with specific project design and mitigation requirements. Now the reason I specifically articulated that county required application process is that for the record, I'm going to have to disagree with the county attorney summary at the beginning uh, where the county attorney asserts that this is a legislative as opposed to quasi judicial process and please allow me to give you the reasons why that's our position. Number one, the county uniquely requires this combined application process. This combined process is used in no other county in Tampa Bay in which I practice. It's plan amendments are separate application, it's zonings are separate application, it's development agreements are separate application. Pinellas County requires, requires a combined process. Therefore, I don't think you can then bifurcate at the end of that process and say, oh, well, forget all that. We're just going to make a legislative decision on the plan amendment. Reason number two is that if you review your staff report, they in fact relied as their sole authority for their opinion of inconsistency with the comp plan, they relied upon the substance and the details of the zoning application, the zoning master plan, and the development agreement. And they actually used those details to formulate their argument that our plan amendment request was inconsistent. Well, staff can't have it both ways. They either can't use that information and they have to approach this as a legislative decision, or if they elect to use that site-specific detailed information, which they required, they then have converted this into a quasi-judicial process. Finally, this matter was noticed and heard by your LPA as a combined application. We were required to present, argue, and defend the zoning, the master plan, the development agreement, and the plan amendment as a single hearing, consolidated notice. If you review that legal notice, it was a combined hearing. And in fact, your LPA vote was not a legislative decision on the plan amendment. They were told by the county attorney at that hearing that they were conducting a quasi-judicial hearing. We had to comply with the quasi-judicial hearing and their recommendation was based upon the results of a quasi-judicial hearing. Therefore, for the legal record, it is our position that you have boxed yourselves into a quasi-judicial determination on this plan amendment. As to housekeeping matters, I want to make sure that our original submittal package and our resubmittal package, which included the CVs for all of our experts who are qualified in the various professional disciplines in which they will speak, are included. I want both of those staff reports incorporated into the record for the reason I just stated. It will become apparent that they relied upon site-specific quasi-judicial matters to render their inconsistency opinion. 
I want the full record of the proceedings before the LPA, including the transcript of the LPA hearing included in the record, because you will hear the county attorney there tell them that it was a quasi-judicial proceeding on all those applications. And finally, I want these thousands of emails and postcards and 20,000 petition signatures preserved under the public records law. I want all of that public opposition entered into this record so that it's part of the proceedings. Now, after those housekeeping matters, I'd like to turn to the substance. And despite all that, we are here to convince you that this is actually a sound request and that it is entirely consistent with the comprehensive plan. First, this land has always been zoned residential. Let me say that again. It has always, from the beginning of Pinellas County zoning until we stand here tonight, it's been zoned for residential. It is presently zoned residential agriculture, which on its face would allow 48 single family homes. Now, the staff takes the position that despite that zoning that's always been there, that the comp plan FLU designation prohibits that development. We'll get to that in a moment. But the important thing is that when the county commission, your predecessors in 1985, rezoned this land, the county unilaterally rezoned this land. It had been R1 and R2, which was consistent with those adjacent neighborhoods and which would have allowed these 273 units. The county unilaterally down zoned it in 1985 from R1 and R2 to AE. In the minutes of the county commission hearing, the property owner question why the county commission was doing that and they said it's because you're actually using it for a golf course and therefore you are in your conditional use per uh, your conditional use permit you you have an interim use for golf course and to make the zoning match the present use we're going to change it to ae the property owner said but what if we decide to stop the golf course operation and we decided to go ahead and develop the 273 units that were platted and that it's always been zoned for. In your county commission minutes, they expressly told that property owner that, that you have the right, we understand, we're just doing this because of the golf course use, you have the right at any time in the future if you stop the golf course use to apply to change the zoning back to allow the residential development. That is in your board minutes. I understand you weren't here, but you are the county commission. They are the county, and they assured the property owner in those minutes in 1985 that they could apply to, to reinstate the residential density. For 66 years, this land was platted as Seminole, Seminole Estate Subdivision. It contained those 273 lots, which is, and this is very important, 3.1 units per acre. And that's a critical density number. Our request is to reinstate that 3.1 units per acre. This land is surrounded by existing residential subdivisions other than the county's own Boca Siega Millennium Park. Here's the close up view. If you look at those surrounding neighborhoods, what we are asking to do is simply to allow the same use here that the county has always seen fit for the immediate adjacent neighborhoods. In fact, the future land use designation we're requesting of residential low, when the staff put up the land use map, all that yellow around us is exactly the designation we're asking for. We're not asking for something different. We're asking to be treated exactly the same as the neighboring communities. We simply want the residential low they enjoy. Those communities are in the same floodplain. They're in the same coastal storm area. Staff's presentation conveniently showed those overlays on our property as if there's a magical curtain on the eastern boundary that stops those from being in those subdivisions. They are in exactly the same predicament. They've been developed that way, they were allowed to be that way, and those people enjoy that lifestyle on Boca Siega Bay which we submit there's nothing wrong with that. And we believe other people coming to Pinellas County would like to enjoy that waterfront lifestyle that made Pinellas County what it is. 
This is the original plat superimposed on our property simply to demonstrate that you can see from all the interconnected streets on the plat, this land was always intended to be developed exactly in the form and with the same density as those surrounding neighborhoods. The streets were lined up, the utilities were stubbed out, and in fact, to prove that point, this is a view looking westward from the neighborhood on our eastern boundary that shows that existing subdivision, that is our property line. That subdivision street was stubbed out to go directly through and continue through our property. Here is another one from another location, same situation. So it is no shock to anyone in these surrounding communities that this land was contemplated to continue a development pattern. Significant, excuse me? I'm gonna to have to ask some, keep the comments to yourself or you can leave, all right? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Importantly, these communities were developed before this golf course. And here's why that's important. If you're going to look at fairness or legislative decisions, this is not a case where the developer came in, developed this golf course first, people then bought around it based upon whether legally correct or not, but the premise that perhaps they were buying golf course frontage or an open space community. That was not the case. Every one of these communities was platted, developed, sold before the owner of this property decided that rather than continuing the residential development pattern that he had platted, he was going to try to operate a golf course as a conditional use. No density, and, and this is important because you know you have a lot of golf courses in this county and I understand the conversion issue, but almost every one of those golf courses, and I helped get many of them approved and developed. In almost all of those cases, the residential density was transferred out of the golf course land to create the density for the surrounding residential housing. That was the typical Pinellas County development pattern. That never happened here. The density was never transferred out of this property to develop these other communities. The density remained, that plat remained well after that. The zoning remained after that. And this land, in our opinion, has inherent density that was never transferred out under the comp plan, zoning, or any RPD development. There was never any deed restriction put on this property. There was never any promise made to these adjacent neighborhoods that this would always be a golf course. Now, in its report, the staff concedes in both reports the staff importantly concedes that our proposal is compatible with the surrounding neighborhoods. And this is very important. They concede that the proposed development pattern and the density is entirely compatible with the surrounding uses. Their argument instead, they can't argue that we're not compatible because of course we are. All you have to do is look at that, the aerials that I showed you. So what they leapfrog into is they try to construct an argument that even though we're compatible with the surrounding neighborhoods, we're somehow inconsistent with your comprehensive plan. There are two elephants in the room as to that argument. And number one, which staff completely ignored at the LPA until I beat them over the head with it at the LPA, now they've tried to construct an argument. But number one, is this objective 1.3 and policy 1.3.5. Now, they argue that you've got to take this, quote, holistic view of your comp plan. Well, I respectfully submit that holistic, in this case, is a pseudonym for subjective. They are trying to construct a subjective, arbitrary argument to create an inconsistency that your comp plan actually resolves on its face, you only have to get into interpretation and balancing and weighing comp plan policies if your comp plan is silent on the specific question at hand. The specific question at hand under your coastal management element is objective 1.3 
which was properly stated. It was properly stated that under objective 1.3, the county shall restrict development within the coastal storm area and shall direct, and here's the important words, population concentrations out of the coastal storm area. Then under objective 1.3, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Under objective 1.3, you then have in your own comp plan 11 policies that explain what you mean by directing population concentrations out. And what 1.3.5 tells you very specifically is that what it means is that you are not to approve any request that puts multifamily or higher density concentrations or any land use uh, designation of more than five units per acre. In other words, there has been a specific finding in your comprehensive plan, which you adopted, that directing population concentrations means we simply don't want dense townhome, multifamily, condo projects in the coastal storm area. However, it expressly authorizes you to allow up to five dwelling units per acre in the coastal storm area. Remember I told you that our proposal was for 3.1 units per acre. That's why I told you that was important. We're only requesting 60% of what your own policy 1.3.5 says you can approve. So if you have, even if the county attorney is correct that this is a legislative decision, legislatively, you are obligated to read your own comp plan. You're obligated to apply your own comp plan policy and your own policy tells you that if we're under five units per acre, that's an appropriate request in the coastal storm area. And you don't have to have a holistic view and weigh and balance a lot of things. All you have to do is be willing to read the one policy and admit what it says. And that respectfully is not being done by the staff. The second elephant in the room is other than this coastal storm area argument, which clearly they're not correct about, their next argument was, okay, then let's get them on the recreation open space element. And this also is answered specifically by the words in your comp plan. And these words are very important. The county shall, and here are the key words, and remember, your lawyers wrote this, they wrote what they intended it to say, and they got you to approve it. But it says you shall prohibit. Now that is a very specific legal word. We all know what prohibit means. It means thou shalt not do it. But look what it tells you to prohibit. It says prohibit the conversion of, again, key word, dedicated recreation open space. Now, your planner kind of ran over this, but it's a critical point. He admitted that dedicated means county-owned space. Dedicated means it is a publicly owned space that the county owns. It means you can't, under your comp plan, convert your parks and your public open spaces to some other use other than recreation open space. So you prohibited yourself Con from converting land that the county purchased or owns. But then look what it says. It says, and encourage. Doesn't say prohibit. They knew how to use prohibit when they wanted to prohibit. They instead used the word encourage, and it says encourage the retention of non-dedicated. Now, your planner also admitted to you just a few moments ago that non-dedicated, what that really means is privately owned. So we are non-dedicated. We are not dedicated. This is privately owned land. So there is absolutely, under objective 1.5, there is absolutely no prohibition in your comprehensive plan from the conversion of privately owned recreation open space. It is simply legally incorrect to argue to you that your comp plan prohibits the conversion of this privately owned land, even though the county 
put recreation open space on it. The reason the county put recreation open space on it at the time was because the owner was using it for a golf course. But his golf course was a temporary conditional use when he still had his residential zoning and when the 1985 county commission assured him that if he stopped the golf course use and wanted to go back to the residential use, that he could do that. Now you're being told that you, that you should not or cannot do that. And that is patently unfair to the property owner. Those are the reasons why we are legally entitled to this result and the comp plan change. I submit, after 41 years of doing this, that if you interpret your comp plan with these factors, if you construe it in the way staff is asking you to, that your comp plan prohibits the change of this private land from its recreation open space to residential low, I respectfully submit that that is applying that recreation open space policy to private land in a way that creates a disproportionate burden on this private landowner because you're telling him he can only use his land for a public purpose. You're telling him he has to keep his land even though he owns it and pays the taxes. He can only use it for the benefit of the public at large. That's what all these emails and postcards and 20,000 signatures want you to do. They want you to create another county park but at the expense of this one private landowner. And you know from your cooperation in the Douglas estate matter and elsewhere that that is, it may be a very legitimate public purpose and it may be a great idea here to double the size of Millennium Park. But the way you do that is you acquire the land for the public purpose. You don't steal somebody's private land for a private purpose by making up a rationale under the comp plan that says you can't plan his, change his future land use designation. It is a pure land grab in the original sense if you apply that interpretation. With that said, I'm gonna turn it over now to our team to actually walk you through the details of the plan uh, and the benefits that this plan uh, can bring to the county and to the surrounding communities. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. A chair. My name is Clark Will Miller. I'm a registered landscape architect with over 15 years of experience. Um, my address 111 South Armenia Boulevard, Suite 201, Tampa, Florida 33609. Just want to make a point. We started this process two years ago with a blank sheet of paper, uh, knowing that the prior application got denied. So we knew going into it that we wanted to coordinate and, and meet with the neighbors prior to even developing a plan. The plan before you was derived after the second charrette and really the, the input of the surrounding neighbors um, that brought forth some of their, if, the, if they knew it couldn't be a golf course, right, it needed to be something else, what would they be able to support? And that really turned into a linear pathway around the property connection, connectivity to Millennium Park, a safe way for them to get back and forth access to Boca Ciega Bay, which is what was really the genesis of this plan. In addition to that, we wanted to bring some creativity to the site. We wanted to bring some curvilinear streets, larger open space tracks on the perimeter, um, preservation of the natural free features along the waterfront and enhance those. Um, integration of a stormwater facility along the perimeter, because what you'll hear later on is that there's a tremendous amount of offsite stormwater that flows onto this property, through this property, untreated and into Boca Ciega Bay. Our intent is to help manage that situation, which you'll hear about that treatment later on. We also are proposing the multi-purpose trail, which I have slides for later on, that were a cat or derived from the charrette that we had with the surrounding residents. Compatibility. This project is proposed to be less dense, dense than the surrounding developments directly based on the current standard, development standards we have today and the code we have to follow, which if you look on maps around the property, our neighborhoods, they hardly have any stormwater, no treatment, hardly any ponds that help treat anything. Therefore, our development has to maintain 
all of our on-site treatment and drain it into the, the bay treated. Um, the next thing I'll say is we are also use, utilizing, to Joel's point, the existing access points that are stubbed out of the original subdivisions on our adjacent to the east and to the north, that was already planned. We're not making new, new street locations, new access points. We're using the existing infrastructure that is there today. The proposed plan as shown on the screen provides maximum public benefit. As you can see with this recreational trail around the property, that was derived from the, sh the shreds that we had with the residents that they felt they would like to have and utilize. This also helps to treat some of the offsite stormwater in a series of chain retention ponds that go around the perimeter and this trail meanders through those as well for a public benefit and educational experience and also to bring in some native flora and fauna. The trail connects from the neighborhoods to the Millennium Park to the west and two locations to the south on Millennium Park or on Boca Sega Bay for canoe and kayak launch to access the waterfront. Uh, in here is a image of what we would anticipate that section looking like, a 50 foot meandering linear trail um, with an eight foot sidewalk in, inside that meanders, landscaping on both sides for screening and protection so that people can't stand on the trail and look directly into the neighboring uh, backyards. This, this trail will be heavily landscaped and also really be a neat, neat feature for the park. And here's another view of what that would look like. In closing, I just want to mention that we have, again, worked on this plan for over two years, uh, met with the neighbors multiple occasions, and county staff listened to all their opinions, thoughts, and helped bring this plan to life. We wanted to create a small residential enclave, not with development in mind, but with public benefit, benefit in mind, cleaning up the property and treating off-site untreated runoff. Then we listened to the surrounding neighbors and integrated their feedback into the design. With what we have presented, we believe it will be a successful, well thought out plan that will become the cornerstone for waterfront development in the future. With that, I'll turn it over to the next presenter. Good evening. My name is Brian Skidmore, I'm with Ardura. I'm an environmental scientist and I have been the ecological services group leader there uh, now for 27 years. I'd like to talk to you a little bit tonight about opportunities with Restoration Bay Project. You saw a map a little bit earlier that showed you the surrounding landscape around the property, okay? The color-coded uh, Homes that you see there are the surrounding lots that, that lie adjacent to what was described earlier as, as a platted community on this property. Those lots, the way that they were developed long before current day stormwater regulations and standards, basically were developed with little to no stormwater treatment capabilities such that the runoff from roads and residential areas went largely untreated and cycled directly through the Restoration Bay property. As the golf course was in place, that meant coming through existing ditches, ponds that were created for the golf course, and draining basically in an untreated state directly into Boca Ciega Bay on the southern boundary. Okay? So I want to kind of couch that with a comparison and contrast of the existing and historic use over the last 45 years of the golf course with what's being proposed with the Restoration Bay project and talk to you a little bit about some of the opportunities we have here to make some environmental enhancements and public benefits that could come out of marrying up a redevelopment of the site with enhancing and improving some of these features, including the stormwater we just talked about. Here we have a version of the plan that's been colorized, so you could see that roughly 52% of the overall project area, that 95.96 acres we talked about, is basically composed of open space uses. That open space, as Clark talked about a little while ago, includes the perimeter linear park around the boundaries of the site, in addition to a 50-foot buffer to the Boca Ciega Millennium Park to our west, where the linear trail system is coupled to 
a stormwater treatment network. So we've got ponds and filter marshes that are basically situated in a linear cascading or treatment train fashion. We talked a little bit late, earlier on, your planner talked about the elevations, 27 feet up at the northeast, cascading down to water elevation at mean, mean sea level. That is a big drop in elevation. What that does for us with opportunities for stormwater treatment is allows us to create a series of cascading treatment ponds and filter marshes along that property perimeter, which sets up very nicely for stormwater BMPs and water quality improvements. So you see that these blue and green areas, the green areas actually represent vegetated littoral zones where wildlife and vegetation is gonna come into play. And then the trails are wrapped through there present public education opportunities, okay? You've got a public access trail system. You come in there with school kids and local residents. You educate them about the improvements, the stormwater, and the benefits to Boca Siega Bay and the surrounding environment. Beyond the stormwater treatment aspects of the project, you can see the shoreline basically along the southern boundary. If that laser works, there you go, right down there. That shoreline is in its current condition under, under the managed golf course condition, had turf grass all the way up to the mangrove edge shoreline, to the jurisdictional line. Tur managed turf grass and whatever goes with application of chemicals and management of a golf course over those 45 years. No buffer, no treatment other than the ponds that were used there for irrigation and basically weren't doing direct discharge, okay? That condition is gonna be replaced with significant vegetated, revegetated buffers that buffer that, that natural mangrove shoreline that's there. We'll take the invasive species like Brazilian pepper, carrot wood, and others that have grown in along the mangrove and in some place replace them along the shoreline. We'll remove those invasive species and replace them with native species to supplement what's already there. We'll create vegetated buffers that buffer the development from that shoreline and we'll create bioswales along there to, to capture additional stormwater. Where right now, as I said, the water over the last 45 years has been draining directly into Boca Siega Bay from that part of the development. All these features, these, these environmental improvements come with public benefits and pair in nicely with the linear park and the stormwater system. Thru throughout the, the evaluation period of the property, we also noticed that there was some cart paths that basically bisected some of the mangrove inlets over there, cutting off the flow. We're, our plan is to remove those fills and restore tidal flushing into there and the nursery and fish habitat that used to be there. In addition to that, we're aware of an archeological resource down in the south east part of the property in and along where the mangroves are. That resource is gonna be preserved and encapsulated in the preservation along the shoreline and will present another publication public education opportunity. And we're gonna talk a little bit more with you about the proposed stormwater condition for the developed use of the property. And for that, I'm gonna introduce Ms. Nicole Lynn, our engineer. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Good evening, everybody. I'm Nicole Lynn, I'm with Ardura. I am the civil group leader and I am a professional engineer licensed in the state of Florida. And I've been practicing for 17 years. Um, on this project, as Brian alluded to, the uh, part of the proposed development um, includes the stormwater opportunities, not only for the surrounding areas to improve uh, those areas of, of development that have occurred in the past that provide no improvement for stormwater whatsoever of their own, whereas this project would propose to provide um, stormwater treatment, not only for those, but in addition to that, its own, which is part of your code. So I'm basically telling you, we're here to present to you for the development, we would be meeting your code requirements, which include nutrient removal, um, which includes uh, the coastal high hazard area, development standards that you all already have identified the requirements to meet within, which we are here to abide by. Um, the FEMA map that was presented by staff earlier I tell you that there's um, a newer map that's in, uh, identified on FEMA's website that has been presented to this board in the past and we are in, will be in compliance with. It includes not only elevation, um, elevations that are uh, descriptive for velocity zone development, but also AE development. Um, so, and X, so we have three different zones that lie within the property from south to north, velocity zones on the south. Those have higher, more stringent um, requirements for development uh, to occur, which 
we're aware of, and so we would bring to you that we would be complying with it. Um, on the north end of the site is the X zone, which allows for uh, development, uh, your typical type of development for homes, on grade type of homes, whereas along the coastline, you would elevate. So anywhere along you know, the, the coastal areas in Pinellas County where the FEMA map uh, presented or the coastal high hazard area map that's presented doesn't stop at the boundaries of this project, right? It continues along the whole entirety of Pinellas County. And I would um, also identify to you that you know, the, the storm surge area is, part of, is taken into account uh, with those FEMA maps, and that's what that study, uh, study is done for. Um, the storm surge is identified. The, the elevations that are included on the FEMA maps are to identify areas of 100-year elevation. <clears throat> and why that's important to put it into perspective is that means 1% chance of being equal or exceeding that level, that elevation, during any given year. So it's not every year over 100 years it's going to happen. It's 1% chance that year. And next year, there's a 1% chance it could happen. OK, so, so that's what those studies are done for, to, to give you background on that. Um, the last thing I want to cover for you all is just quickly uh, utilities. As part of the development, uh, there are existing water mains, sanitary uh, mains, and reclaimed mains uh, that stub to the property, like Joel had mentioned previously. And we are aware of the um, requirements for evaluating those during the process um, of permitting. And um, with staff, working through any improvements that would be necessary to support the project. So uh, I will be available later on for any questions that you may have. But right now I'm going to turn it over to Steve for transportation. Good evening. Steve Henry, Links and Associates, 5023 West Laurel, Tampa 33607. I am a professional regi registered engineer in the state of Florida and have 36 years of experience. Uh, Links and Associates conducted the traffic analysis for this project, and based on the results of our analysis and also what is indicated in your staff report, that the roadway system will operate at acceptable level of service with the addition of this project. Um, as mitigation, As mitigation for the project, the developer is looking at filling in the sidewalk gaps along both uh, 66th Avenue and 116th Street. And you can see on this graphic those areas in which they are proposing to fill in those sidewalk gaps. Um, also, the developer is willing to um, extend, let me go the right way here, let me get the, get the first one, Ex they're going, going the wrong way. but. Uh, this, the developer is willing to extend the northbound left turn lane on 113th at 66th Street. I want to let you know that based on the existing volume today, that northbound left turn lane doesn't meet the current criteria. But the developer is coming in to extend that to meet the current criteria. And you'll notice in the staff report it does indicate that the median opening at 65th Street would have to be closed. We actually did some counts out there to see what the impact would be. There were seven cars using that median opening in the a.m. peak hour and about 20 in the p.m. So very little, and in fact, there are parallel roadways in which vehicles can get to other median openings along 113th. In addition, the developer is looking at extending the northbound left turn lane uh, at 62nd Street on, on 113th. Uh, again, uh, the, if you look at that left turn lane today, it doesn't meet the current standards, even with existing traffic. Um, we also, again, looked at that median opening. There are about 18 cars using it in the AM, about 19 in the PM. Again, very minor volume. Um, and there are alternative accesses to get the median openings within 113. Um, also, if you read the staff report, you, you would look at it and believe that 66th Street, this project's going to have a significant impact, that that's just a, a residential street. In fact, we would, uh, the Blessed Sacrament Catholic Church has access to that street, and there are 100, 265 cars from the church, or from the school, using that access, using that roadway during the a.m. peak hour. We're going to add about 90. 
uh, which is significantly less than what's currently out there today. And it will operate at acceptable level of service uh, based on, again, your staff report and also on, based on our analysis. Um, and finally, um, if you read the staff report, it says that, that with this project, there's the potential to double the delay at the intersection of 113th and 66th Avenue during the AM peak hour. We actually did the analysis for it. It's actually in our report. Uh, and that shows in the AM peak hour, there is 16.7 seconds of delay, which is a level of service B, as in boy. Uh, and with our project, that will increase to 19 0.9 seconds, again, level of service B, for only 3.2 seconds increase in delay. And that concludes my presentation, unless you've got any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Joel, too, again, just to wrap up briefly here, and just to emphasize what Mr. Henry said about the traffic, I want to emphasize that both, this, both his traffic study and your transportation staff's review and approval of that study, your staff agreed that there is no issue as to the level of service, that, that all of the affected roadways will continue to operate at acceptable level of service. So that is the legal standard, that is the criteria, not subjective views of whether there's more or less traffic, but the fact is what do the people that are technically qualified, which is your transportation staff, and our traffic consultant have already reached those conclusions. Also want to point out that those lane extensions in 113th Street, please pay close attention to what Steve said. Those are pre-existing deficiencies. If our project is never built, you have existing county deficiencies in the roadway. They're not our responsibility. Okay, they've been allowed to exist now. What this developer is proposing to do is to come in on his dime and help you remedy your pre-existing deficiency in the road. So we can't call something that's already there. And under state law, we're not legally required to mitigate something that's a pre-existing failure. However, we offered in the development agreement to do that. Um, so with that said, uh, the only other issue I want to touch upon is your staff put up one slide that there's one statement in your comp plan policy about recreation open space should not be changed um, where it's feasible to continue the use. And even though we don't think that it's necessarily our legal obligation to prove that the golf course was a failure, we're, we've demonstrated that, we submitted it in the application, we presented it at LPA, this is the slide. My clients bought this from Wells Fargo Bank as a failed golf course, a special asset. They bought it from the bank after a foreclosure. So that tells you that despite years of operation, the operator, the prior operator, could not make a go of it. As part of my client's due diligence, Wells Fargo Bank provided the financials from that prior golf course operation. And for the periods prior to my client's purchase, you can see the red ink in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, when my client purchased, he's been accused of buying this with no intention of salvaging the golf course operation. Here are the true facts. When they purchased the property, they purchased 80 brand new golf carts. They made many capital improvements to the course. They revamped the marketing campaign. They increased league play opportunities. They added a Sunday brunch. They added happy hours. They added live music and more. Because of all those efforts, the golf course had the best year it had had from the beginning of the financials when the bank had it. However, despite those efforts, my clients lost, and it's graphically depicted here, they lost $200,000 that year. Despite, and that doesn't count all the capital improvements and the golf carts that they bought. So I submit to you that they ha if it is relevant and if it's legally required, I believe they did make a good faith effort to make a go of it. The staff has told you that the only use that's allowed for this property, other than as a park under recreation open space, is a golf course. Well, the golf course failed. It has been shut down. It's conditional use permit. Your use permit expired. You granted a demolition permit. The clubhouse has been demolished. The cart facilities have been demolished. It is not going to be opened again as a golf course. 
And I, I, you know, this would be like saying that if you and your spouse started a restaurant on the neighborhood corner and you invested a million dollars and you did your darndest to make a go of it, but people didn't come and it didn't work and you lost two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year, that you should be required to continue to run a failing business because that's the zoning use that the property allows and that you can't change it to something reasonable. You know, you can't convert to office or you can't convert to condos that you're required by law to run a failing business. I don't think that is the requirement and I don't think that's appropriate. I know we're almost out of time. I only have a minute and a half. I will reserve what little I have for rebuttal. Uh, we're happy to answer any and all questions. My experts will come back if there are any details you need. But thank you so much for your patience. I know it was long, but as you can see, there was a lot of material to cover. Thank you. Joel, I have about a minute 10 remaining for rebuttal. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, before, we, um, before we go to um, the public for comments, um, do we have any questions from any of the commissioners at this point? Or do we just uh, want to hear from the public first before we deliberate? As I'm getting nods. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, we have um, four people um, in a in a preferred order that are going to speak on behalf of four other people. So, for that to be effective or affected. Um, those four people must be present. So I am going to first call up Brian Bowles, um, who is the Save the Tides attorney, uh, but I'll need to see uh, Gail Slaughter to raise her hand, to see if she's here. There's people outside, I'm assuming. Is that the case? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So it, it, I know. So we're going to give time. Yes. Might it be possible to take about a three minute break just so that none of us have to miss any of this testimony? All right, we'll be starting back at 7.30. Please. Okay, thank you. We'll be starting back at 7.30. Um, we got four groups of four. So thank you. We can remember who they put down, try to make sure that they're coming forward so when we get to that point, they'll be readily available to wave their hand. We'll ask them to stay. Thank in. you. Sure.
And I am, um, I'm going to have, there are four speakers with 16 people that they are representing. And we're going to bring those four in for each of the names that I read at a, you know, four at a time. We're going to take care of that up front for all four speakers, okay? So the first one is for Brian Bowles. And the four people are Gail Slaughter, Ed Slaughter, Wendy Kin Kidney, and Ronald Hamery. Gail and Ed Slaughter. Ah, there you are. Hi. Wendy Kidney. Oh, well, there's Wendy. And Ronald Hamery. Okay, so you four are here. Um, that that uh, will allow Brian Bowles to have 10 minutes. Susan Finch is going to speak second. And the four people that she is representing are Barbara Francis. Do I see Barbara Francis? Linda Corso. Where's Barbara? I have Barbara. Linda Corso? I oh okay. Well I gotta see you. Oh there you go. Thank you. Nancy Fordham and Alan Fordham. Okay, thank you. And then thirdly, Bill Kempton will be speaking. The four people that have given up their time. Gail Kessinger. Up, oh, hi Gail. Vivian Stevens. Okay, thank you. Bob Geyer and Carol Camp. Thank you. So that allows Bill Kempton to speak. And number four, Richard Gehring. Four names. David Camp. Thank you. Jerry Methfessel. I know I messed that name up. Sorry about that. Uh, Jerry. Greg Jessup. Brandy Jessup. Both here? Okay, we're good to go. Thank you all. Appreciate your, your being patient with me. All Mr. right. Mr. Chair? Yes. They can leave the room now, right? Yes. If they want to? Yes. All right. We will start. No, those are your spares in case you didn't have somebody show. All right. Let me get it right here. Brian Bowles, go right ahead. Yes. You've got 10 minutes. Good evening. My name is Brian Bolvis. I'm an attorney uh, with the firm of Manson, Bolvis, Donaldson, and Varn. We practice land use law, environmental law, um, and property rights law. We have the honor of representing many um, cities and counties in this capacity around the state. City of Clearwater, City of St. Pete, City of Largo, Palm Beach County, Levy County, uh, to name a few, City of Tampa. Uh, I regularly am involved in uh, land use litigation disputes and property right claims, compensation claims associated with denial of permits, uh, especially involving the Burt Harris Act. I, reg I regularly lecture to conferences regarding the Burt Harris Act uh, every year at the annual summer school. I've been the one uh, making the presentation on the Burt Harris Act and have litigated those cases, including a recent $16.5 million transaction uh, involving the sale of 20,000 acres to the state of Florida down in uh, Br uh, Broward County. Um, as the result of a Burt Harris Act uh, claim that I made. So uh, I've been on both sides of it and have understandings of it. First, I'd like to uh, say that when the, when the board down zoned this property, the representation has been made as the board said, oh, just come back anytime you want. Well, the, the fact is, is that the board said you can apply again. It didn't say you get it, okay? So, you know, it, it's not as though your hands are bound by some prior board. Uh, and what you should also note is that this applicant did not apply for the lowest common denominator. There are, through, my understanding from the planners, what the planners tell me, and, you know, I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, but I won't attempt to be a land 
land use planner. It's a very you know, complicated area. But the planners are telling me that you have three categories below what they're asking for in terms of density for residential type use. So it's not like you're taking the property's residential use if you say no to this comp plan. I would like to address Commissioner's uh, comment regarding the traffic. The, the, the illustration that you saw, what's interesting is the illustration that you saw up there was exactly the same. Basically, Bill, Mr. Kimpton will show you the, the illustration from the estuaries. In 1985, the, the plan that was turned down was, looked exactly like the plan that they showed you. And what it showed you was two driveways coming out onto residential streets. 66th Street, which dead ends on that side, 113th, and Irvin Avenue. And what Mr. Um, you heard from uh, Links and Associate, their fellow came up here and told about the few little sidewalk improvements and other things they're going to do on 113th. But the facts are in their report, which is in this record, is that they're going to introduce the golf course had 269 trips a day. This project that they proposed has 2,619 daily trips. So that's nine fold and, and all roads lead to two residential streets. Irvin Avenue, you saw the stub outs. They showed you the stub outs. That's the nature of the streets that connect to this property. And there's gonna be two points where, it, where the gates come in and out of this uh, exclusive community. And so you're gonna have 2,619 2, daily trips down those couple of roads. So Mr. It, there is a Mr. significant Chair. impact. Oh, it can't cut his time. Well, the, no, Hold I, the time, please. Stop. Yeah, hold the time. Yes. I, that's what I wanted to know was, should we wait, write our questions down or yeah, wait please, until he's finished? Please, please write them down and we'll get to it when he's done. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. There's been the suggestion that somehow if you turn this down that there's a claim for compensation. I've been, as I said, involved in many Burt Harris Act claims. In this particular case, what's interesting is the record that's before this commission indicates, and it, this is the revenue chart that was present, that's in your package. Uh, Mr. Two showed you expense side, but if you look at the revenue side, for the years 2015, 16, and 17, the revenue was going steadily up. From 2014 to 2017, this, this applicant bought the golf course in 2016, and the revenue continues to go up, except for they stopped it on July 1st, 20, uh, 2018. And what's interesting is the revenue for the last year, which was their operation in July, that's a half a year. If you doubled this, it would be the tallest bar on the chart. So, you know, there's some there, there's some discussion that needs to be had regarding how viable a golf course could be at this site. Under any circumstances, it is not a reasonable investment-backed expectation for this property owner to assume that this commission will give them what they want. Uh, that's the standard in the Burt Harris Act, and there have been a couple of cases. The uh, one case, uh, uh, the Citrus up in Citrus County, a fellow uh, bought a piece of property. He wanted to put condominiums on a piece of property um, that was zoned coastal low density residential. Uh, he, he was denied. He files a Burt Harris Act claim. What did the court tell him? The court told him you had no reasonable investment backed expectation that you're going to get condominiums. The comp plan was inconsistent with that at the time you bought it. And, and another famous case is uh, Palm Beach Polo versus Village of Wellington. In that case, a developer bought an area called Big Blue, I would recommend to anybody that they not buy areas that have a name on them labeled by the environmentalist group. But in this case, that guy did. Uh, and it was Big Blue, and he was turned down for development in that area. And the, and the court said, when you bought this property, you knew what it was. Just like this property owner, when he bought it in 2016, he knew what it was. He's come into you with the exact same site plan that was vacated voluntarily by an owner many, many years ago. Uh, uh, and a site plan which was rejected and then withdrawn by Taylor Morrison, almost the, the, it looks the same to me. Uh, and it's the same number of units. And so is there a reasonable investment-backed expectation that you get to use this property for this use? The answer is no. I would recommend that any lawyers out there that they not take this on a contingency. I certainly wouldn't do it. 
And, and so I think that the, what you have to look at here is whether or not there are other uses and whether or not it's compatible with the comprehensive land use plan because uh, from the reports I've read by staff and by the other planners that have been hired by parties in this case, it seems to me that there are many, many, many aspects of the plan that are inconsistent with the comprehensive land use plan. Um, and, and my understanding is that when you, this property owner has come in, asked for a particular, I'm sorry, I can't believe that, uh, has come in and asked for a particular um, uh, resolution or a particular use of the property, um, when that use uh, is not the least intensive, there are other alternatives and it's not up to the staff to design this project on behalf of the applicant. The other thing that I'd like to point out uh, is that under the comprehensive land use plan, the impact to the surrounding community is important. I already touched on the traffic, and they showed you that trail. The trail is an open 24-hour-a-day invasive uh, system of sidewalks that goes all the way around. And, and, and when you deliberate, if you go back and look at the illustration that was put up there, there's an eight-foot concrete block wall on the development side of the property, and there's a chain-link fence on the existing side of the property. Um, and so that tells you everything you need to know about the trail. The trail is, is not a great amenity. And, and but my understanding is now they're asking you for uh, the comp plan issue is, is what's before you. Uh, and in that context, um, you should look at the possible density that could be put on this property and the inconsistency with the comp, with the comp plan. And I think the staff has done a very thorough job of um, identifying the limitations with the comp plan. Um, there are, I have other issues uh, and, and have, if the brownfield issue comes up, we'll address that uh, later at that time. But uh, at this point, I would just say that there, the, the record before this body, whether it's quasi-judicial or legislative, amply supports a decision to turn this down. In fact, the greatest weight of the evidence uh, is in favor of turning this down from a record standpoint. Uh, there's been le very little put in, the, in, in evidence to support why it is that, that lesser intense uses couldn't be made of the property or what other uses. Uh, this is not an all or nothing proposition from the standpoint of the comp plan. So uh, in that respect, uh, I would urge that based on this record uh, that the uh, land use amendment be denied. Thank you. And I apologize for the phone. That's okay. Thank you, Brian. All right, Susan Finch. Good evening, board members. Susan Finch, uh, on behalf of Mr. Tom Beckwith, that's my client. He lives at 5728 Oakhurst Drive in Seminole. I'm a land use planner. I've been practicing for the last 32 years. I am certified by the American Institute of Certified Planners. It's my honor to participate in this process. I was asked to provide a planning analysis of the requested comprehensive plan amendment and rezoning of property formerly known as the Tides Golf Club. I have submitted a complete planning analysis as well as my resume into the record that was submitted prior to the LPA hearing. The subject property is 95.96 acres and currently designated, as you've heard many times tonight, recreation, open space, and preservation by the comprehensive plan. The request to amend the land use category to residential low and preservation is at the heart of why this should be denied. The county's website states that Pinellas County is the most populi populated county in Florida with 3,347 people per square mile. This point alone highlights the critical need for open space in Pinellas County. Let me go to the slide here. Let's see. Yes, there we go. So there's the request Rem and the, uh, at hand tonight, amend the county's comprehensive plan from residential open space and preservation to residential low and preservation. So I showed you already the most densely populated county in Florida. Now, Mr. Tu has talked about this policy and I will read it to you in terms of how I think it speaks to you. Recreation, open space, and culture element. Objective 1.5, in recognition of the limited amount of available open space remaining within the county, Pinellas County shall prohibit the conversion of dedicated open space, dedicated mean county owned, and encourage the retention of non-dedicated recreation open space land uses. Purely means non-dedicated, the county doesn't own it. 
So I'm here to encourage you to retain it. It's needed, it's important. The county-wide plan rules also address this issue to retain open space in Pinellas County. Countywide plan rules land use 12.1 in recognition of the limited amount of available open space remaining within the county strongly discourage the conversion of recreation open space to preservation and preservation to other designations, strongly discourage. Countywide plan rules land use 12.4 discourage the conversion of golf courses to other land uses without addressing how the loss of open space and recreational opportunities for the community will be mitigated. This point is very important as the applicant has described how they purchased the golf course, they've provided you financial data that it was unsuccessful. What they haven't addressed is how they plan to deal with the loss of open space. The requested residential low land use category has locational criteria adopted in your comprehensive plan. The majority of the property is located in the 100-year floodplain. The RL category states the RL category is only appropriate, only appropriate in the 100-year floodplain if the preservation and or the recreation, recreation open space categories are not feasible. This isn't my language or, or Mr. Tu's language. This is the language for the locational characteristics in the RL category in which they are requesting. How have they shown that the recreation open space category is not feasible on this property? They only told you they bought a golf course and it didn't work out. I've prepared a before and after aerial photograph of you for you of the property. There we go, here's the before. So you'll see the subject property, the surrounding area. You'll see an aerial that shows a sea of development. And then in the middle, let's see if we can do this here, you'll see Millennium Park right here and then the subject property. So the sea of development surrounds and protects this open space and what ha would happen if you choose to transmit it, all I did was take their site plan and put it on top. That's the parcel boundary, and then you'll see that loop road and the development that's proposed. So before, after. That's your loss of open space right there. It's as clear as day. The subject property is located in the coastal, coast, coastal storm area. A significant portion of the property is located in the 100-year floodplain. 27% of the property is located in the velocity zone, and over 20% of the property is located in the coastal high hazard area. Development in these areas is discouraged for a reason. New development affects the evacuation efficiency of the existing community. It also affects shelter space availability. That there are several comprehensive plan goals and objectives which discourage development in these areas. These are, most importantly, the coastal management element, objective 1.3, Pinellas County shall restrict development within the coastal storm area and direct population concentrations out of the coastal storm area. This plan shows 273 units. I would submit to you that is a population concentration. The applicant states that those proposed 273 units are similar to the existing subdivisions to the north and the east. Well, that may be true, but remember, here's what's critical. Those subdivisions that are there were built in the late 1960s and early 70s, well before you had any of these comprehensive plan requirements, well before any of these policies, well before we know as much as we know now and how important it is to keep people out of these emergency areas. The applicant has based the request for 273 units on a plat that was approved in 1926. That plat was voluntarily vacated by the property owner, then property owner, in 1992, almost 30 years ago. 30 years ago, that plat was vacated and has no bearing, no entitlement, no weight on today's environment. The property has been developed with a golf course since 1969 until 2018. A prior application for 170 units was filed and then later withdrawn after Pinellas County recommended denial. This is now 100 more units. It is no surprise that the county staff and the neighbors oppose this project. It should be no surprise to the applicant that the request to amend the comprehensive plan to residential low would be opposed by staff 
based on the significant number of comprehensive plan policies that tell you this is a bad idea. The need for open space in Pinellas County is clear. Clear by reviewing the adopted goals, objectives, and policies in the comprehensive plan, and clear by reviewing this aerial. The applicant has taken the position that one policy in the coastal management element, element means that density less than five acres is permitted, and therefore they're entitled to residential development as they propose a density of 3.1. The comprehensive plan is just that. It's comprehensive. It's the county's vision. It's a long range plan. It's a document that states the goals of the county. The county staff report lists pages of comprehensive plan policies which result in their recommendation for denial. County staff reviewed the original comprehensive plan amendment request along with the accompanying requests and recommended denial. The applicant was then given the opportunity to come back to revise their application in response and they did so by writing a letter on November 25th, 2020. This response did not change the number of dwelling units, did not change the proposal to develop re residential in the coastal storm area. The changes were minor and included restricting lots in the evacuation zones to larger lots, but not prohibiting those lots in the, in the evacuation zone. I filed a planning analysis into the record which lists numerous policies as well from uh, various plan elements as well as the countywide plan rules to conclude that this application is inconsistent with the comprehensive plan and should not be transmitted to the state. I'd urge you to do that and end this today. Thank you so much. Okay, Bill Kempton. Good evening, uh, William Kempton, you can call me Bill. Um, so, uh, just moved to uh, Dunedin, 1645 Chaplain Court. Um, been here a long time, resident since 1971. My first uh, law firm was involved with the law firm was in 1971. I've seen a lot happen, I've seen a lot of growth here. And uh, some of those growth statistics are that uh, 1965 we had like 250,000 people, and uh, 1971 about 540,000 people, and you can keep going right on up. In 1985, when the property was down zone, we had about 800,000 people. Today we have uh, over a million, and uh, the growth does not seem to be stopping at all. And you can add to that 13 to 15 million visitors because the biggest business here is tourism. So at any given time, if you wanna go down the streets or you wanna go to any of the beaches or you wanna go anywhere in this county, it's a big problem because the roads are packed. Everything is packed. And we're out of land. We don't have any land anymore. And we have this, these rules in the land use plan to try to protect open space. And I think we really need to be seriously looking at it. Uh, and this case is probably one of the biggest demonstrations why. It was mentioned that we have a lot of people per square mile. I differ a little bit with Susan's number. My number is 3,560 people for every square mile in Pinellas County. At, at state, uh, 1990, we had about 13 million people. Now we have about 22 million people. And it looks like uh, by 2030, we'll have 25 million people. And you can add to that 120 million visitors a year. Um, in 1985, when the, um, the down zoning occurred, that was a very important milestone for this property. It was because they wanted to protect this open space. And we have a witness from that hearing, and he wrote a letter. I'll read it. He wrote it to uh, a couple named the Furmans who lived at 6154 Irving Circle in Seminole. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Furman, thank you for your letter concerning zoning case number Z3468. Please be advised that this case is scheduled to be heard by the Board of County Commissioners on October 22nd, and I have taken the liberty of filing, the, filing your letter with the Secretarial Department so that it may become a matter of public record. As you probably know, I instigated the rezoning of this piece of property to ensure that those people who had bought and built in that area would have the open space and assurance of a recreational area. As time goes by and the land becomes scarcer, you will see more attempts to utilize open space 
such as golf courses for commercial or development projects. If this is allowed once, no one has been told there would be open space again or, or could it be guaranteed in the future? Thank you for your comments and taking the time to write. Sincerely, Charles Rainey. Charles Rainey was a friend of mine. He was a friend of Pinellas County. He's a friend of this commission. And he was looking out for the people of Pinellas County. He was one of the greatest commissioners I've ever known. And uh, I think this letter shows how much he cared. So going on, some of the credibility issues that I heard tonight were, you know, trying to use this 1926 plat. If that was the case, general development would still be developing swamp land all over Florida, if there is any more swamp land, because as I mentioned, there hardly is any land left. Um, so that wasn't credible. And the mere fact that those streets stubbed out where they are isn't relevant because we all know after every recession, there's some of those cases. And after the great recession that we all went through recently, there's any number of those all over the country, but now they're all gone. This phenomena that we are dealing with right now isn't limited to Pinellas County, it's everywhere. There's a huge growth thing going on, but it's really magnified in Florida. Um, and Florida now is probably one of the top two growth states in the United States and we're gonna get more uh, seats in the house because of it, and some of these northern states are gonna lose some. Another credible question was um, the planner for the applicant said they selected a clean piece of paper and really thought this out when they made their application. However, that's the one that uh, was denied by the uh, planner, planning staff uh, 10 years ago, nine years ago, and it was called the estuary then. If you saw the one that's been shown tonight, this is the exact same picture, except that this one had more open space than the current one does, and it had 100 less units. And they, um, we were all sitting at the LPA hearing waiting for everybody to show up so we could explain our opposition, and we were told that it was withdrawn. There wasn't any advance notice, they just knew that there was no way to win it, so they were no-show back then. So. I don't have a whole lot to say. I'm not a planner, I'm not an administrative attorney, I'm not a land use attorney, I'm just a real estate attorney, a lowly real estate attorney in a county. And I can tell you what, we're busy because whatever is going on here in the market, it's completely insane. Everything is overpriced, everything is crazy. We're out of land. I don't know how we slow it down, but I don't think we should take the little bit of remaining open space we have here and take it away from the neighborhoods. Basically, the request here is to take the value out of this land and give it to a developer who isn't a home builder, and they're just seeking entitlements. They didn't really, they never planned to operate a golf course. They knew what was going on. That was cover. This is, this is just an opportunity to take the value out of neighborhoods and give it to a developer who, who wants to gather entitlements so that perhaps they can flip it to somebody else and maybe it's somebody in uh, New York or Wall Street. So I ask you, in behalf of these neighborhoods, and particularly the ones around this particular open space property, to deny this request. As I mentioned, I've been a lawyer for 50 years now. I've spent 20% of that time on this case, the last 10 years. And, and all these people will keep fighting. There's a lot of green shirts out in the hallway. There's 19,000 signed petitions. I think that this is something that really needs to be saved and I hope you'll give it careful consideration. Thank you. Richard Gehring, we all have 10 minutes. Good evening, Richard Gehring. Uh, I'm office at 605 Palm Boulevard in Dunedin, Florida, and I have handed out a copy of this. I hope you all got one, because we've made enough for staff and for the commission uh, to go through this slide presentation. And we are here, as Bill said, uh, nine years. Uh, this is really an issue of implementing the comp plan, and these, the neighbors in the green uh, shirts have been relying on the comp plan. They believe that this is protecting uh, the character of their neighborhood and their their conditions, and they want you to rec to act uh, consistent with that compliant element. So the tides is a commitment to neighborhoods, but the critical scarcity of open space is also the key issue. 
If you could look at the end of the rec recommendation that Taylor Morrison withdrew from, there was staff in that recommendation added the entire list of all of the privately held golf course land in Pinellas County, and it totaled 5,017 5, acres. The graphic on the right of this shows the 1975 plan. And this is 46 years later, and the golf course is operated earlier than 75, so it's a 50-year golf course. And I'm a graybeard, okay? I've been around a long time. I was 26 when this statute was adopted. I was 27 when it was put in place in the county. And I was 28 whenever the county amended it. So that's a long time ago. And the reliance issue, Joel so blithely says, oh, oh, it was, it was a temporary uh, you know, overlay issue. It was, it was some component to hold the land. It was never intended. And then he digs up an, under, uh, an abandoned plat and says, that's the real public purpose. Um, I totally, and we totally, in, on behalf of the neighborhood, reject that. I want to thank the staff, administration, the planning group for making three consecutive LPA recommendations for denial of the land use open space change on this. It's a critical issue of the golf course site, and it's been done. I want to emphasize there was something not said in the, this hearing by Mr. Tu that was said at the DRC and was said at the LPA. He alluded to an elaborate finger on the, on the scale by the administration and by the commission giving direction to the staff to, to do these denials. And he, he basically f rolled that into his presentation of, a, of, of the negative impacts on his, on his uh, client. But Larry Arrington and that staff, under another county administrator, recommended a denial. You know, Renee Vincent, on the current administration <laughs> recommended denial. And Carol Strickland's here tonight, and she's the new uh, staff person, and, she's, and they've recommended denial. And I don't think you can say over nine years that there's been some collusive action to find a way to, uh, to you know, do something negative to this, to this particular argument that Joel's making. This is very clearly the bottom line here. 35 plan and policy inconsistencies means a denial. A lot of what is in the slide package has been said, so I hit the high points. Staff did the background. They did the department interface. You have some great staff that spent time on some of these complex issues. There's evidence and findings on all these issues. There's outlining coherent policy, and they conclude deny the current application. This is what they applied for, another 103 units from what was originally turned down for Taylor Morrison. The plan controls, and I'm trying to blend the staff recommendation here to the BCC with the staff recommendation to the LPA, because it's got a lot of meat in it. And, and I wouldn't hit the other points with the LPA, except that they've demanded that they want you to look at all their issues. But the primary consideration, based on the comp plan, comp plan inconsistencies, is demonstrated in page 26 through 27 of the staff LPA denial. Tonight, in their seven-page summary, the staff put in denial of the transmittal of the ordinance. That's the key issue. If you, this doesn't leave this room, it doesn't go to the state, it doesn't go to the PPC uh, forward Pinellas, because it is not your, con your consideration that this should be a plan amendment. So the request for this large scale should be denied, and the flume amendment for the 95 should be denied, and the applicant is proposing the 273 units and in the DRC meeting and some in the LPA, there was reference to our goal is very clear, as uh, Agent Carpenter for the application said, this says million dollar units and this is $273 million and that's what we we're trying to pursue. And he made that very point in, the, in his public presentation. The recommended action for the components are not consistent with all the other, other elements do not mean you don't need to be addressed in detail because if this land use is a failure, you will not address those issues. The vulnerable coastal location has been covered in great detail. Staff is recommending denial. The local planning agency unanimously, and I have come before this body many, many times with split votes and asked if there's a split vote of the LPA, you know there's a problem with what, how people discuss this. So here's a unanimous position of the LPA backed by the 286 letters that were negative, 46 postcards, 19,000 signatures, and 2,600 names on the, on the online petition. So I can't exaggerate the negativity. It's right there in black and white in front of us. All these issues in the staff report are in great detail. 
The, the vulnerability is the key issue of the flooding issue. The transportation component was addressed in, in the earlier discussion, but you do add another 2,000 trips and it does affect the neighborhood. Can, the recommended summary for the, for the topics that were done by this staff report was planning consistency, floodplain, 46 years of recreation open space, vulnerable location, producing risk, 273 units is like 500, you know, put 2.3 people per household and you got 500 people living there uh, waiting for the Cat 2, Cat 3 storm. This is a build out county, open space resources are scarce and LPA made unanimous denial. The components of it have already been stressed and I don't want to go through them today, so I'm going to hit the left hand side very quickly. 100 year floodplain, velocity zone, coastal storm surge, all those issues say don't put people at risk and your policies are consistently being addressed by the staff in that area. Land area perpetually open space for 46 years since I was in my late 20s. And so it's, it's not an, a temporary use, it's a very clear use that was put in place and it's difficult to support the introduction of population into a vulnerable coastal area. I, the fact that earlier areas of the county were developed, in 1926 it was the boom, there was no comp plan, there was no zoning, there was no regulatory process, and I think the county was about 12 years old. I think you were created from Pillsborough in like 1912. So the, the conditions were such, you went to the courthouse and you filed your document and that became the plat. The five unit per acre rule is, 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 is acted like it, it's, a, it's a right to get to the five units per acre. It is not. All of the, all of the density categories in the Pinellas planning structure are zero to something. So the staff has discretion to analyze the impact. And in this case, they do analyze and say that retention of open space in a vulnerable area is very important and we, therefore we are not pursuing this and favoring it. Um, I've done a lot of public sector and private sector sides. I've represented, worked with the county, worked with you, and we've been a long-term player, but this is a non-responsive plan as it's submitted. It requires all of these components to be acted upon. It requires the plan to seek and set aside the vulnerable areas, and it, does, and it doesn't achieve any of the policy issues that are critical, and that's why I think that as we look at this, 50 years of open space, as the staff said in their report, carries a heavy burden. If you think they've met that burden, I don't. They recycled the Taylor Morrison plan, they came back in it, they took back their plan and tried to resubmit it, and in resubmitting it, they gave a 14-page policy complaint document about how they disagree on how the staff interpreted your policies. This is a very weak-based position, so their burden, I do not believe, was met. The precedent of setting this open space, you're looking at this case and the people in the green shirts are worried about their neighborhoods. But with 5,000 acres of golf course in this county, it's a county-wide issue. And as we worked in years ago with the Pinellas by Design for Economic Development, 20 years ago, Karen, <laughs> the, uh, this, there could be a planning, a planning by design or Pinellas by Design for quality of life and, and key issues of culture and open space. And I think that's a, an issue we should be talking about because this is going to be an ongoing issue where you need to set direction. I know you're looking at land use policies and acquisition policies in your discussions. This whole stormwater issue and the quality of the water that's going to come out, staff has rejected it as on balance not being enough of a benefit to offset the negative impacts. And this one slide, I could have given you one slide saying, you know, 35 policy inconsistencies equal denial. Uh, Joel doesn't choose, Joel cherry picks five or six policies and says, oh, 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 these are, these, these are the ones that count. Well, comp planning is a totalistic, comprehensive look at things. All those policies matter. Thank you very much. In closing, I appreciate your attention, and I want to state that okay. We went through all of the policy issues to drive this, Thank you. and your actions tonight will set forth the appropriate action if you deny ZLU 1409-19. Save the tides. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> we are going to um, move into individuals who um, are, are mostly the, who are here. There's a few, just a few that are online as well. So um, 
uh, most of, of you who want to speak, I'm, I'm assuming will um, uh, have heard the presentations tonight. And if you want to, you can even just say, I agree with the presentations that were made tonight and, and shorten your three minutes if you'd like. Um, but you're entitled to three minutes, and so please come forward as I call your name. I'll try to call three in a row so that we can have you all ready to, to speak. And the first person that will speak would be Colleen Dan, Dana Miller, and then Patricia Kirby, and then Don, it looks like um, there's an L and a D on the, I just don't know from, um, the, oh, Ladd, I guess it's Don Ladd, excuse me. That'll be the third person. Okay, Colleen, go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Chair, commissioners, and county staff. My name is Colleen Dana Miller, and I live on 66th Avenue. I thank you all for this opportunity to finally get to speak with you regarding the Tides property. I know it's late and past many of our bedtimes, but we truly appreciate you being here and listening to us. I was born right here in Seminole, then a more rural community with many farms and orange groves. Oddly, I lived on 66th Avenue, a few blocks from the 66th Avenue I live on now. I used to play at the end of the street, which was a bird sanctuary, a bird sanctuary. It is now Long Bayou Condominiums. Behind my house was Hutchinson's farm. I could feed the donkey and the horses, carrots, and I even rode my first steer there. It is now a trailer park. After moving in and out of Seminole many times during my husband's military career, it was finally time for us to retire and come home. We looked for a year and a half to find the perfect place to settle for the rest of our lives. We found our dream home and put our life savings into it. And it was on the Tides Golf Course. I had finally found nature in the backyard once again. It was a thriving golf course and home to so many endangered and waiting birds and wildlife. It was bought by Ron Carpenter and Jeffrey Hills. Developers only buy golf courses for one reason, and that is to develop them. It took him only two years to run it into the ground and claim he couldn't turn a profit. Perhaps if he didn't know how to run a golf course, he shouldn't have bought one. If he wanted to put 273 homes somewhere, he shouldn't have bought recreational open green space. It was never his intention to run it as a profitable golf course. He thought he could bully his way into changing land use and zoning designations. Why do we even have designations in a comprehensive plan? It's to keep balance in an already overpopulated county, to look and plan for future and to preserve and protect this county from those that come after us. If we have learned anything from this pandemic, it's that we must preserve outdoor activities and open green space. They are vital to making strong, healthy, and happy communities. Once open green space is gone, it will be gone forever. I have seen his, ap this applicant's management up close and in personal. Thanks. I will just take the time to show you what nice open green space golf courses with wildlife look like. Thanks. I will show you Colleen. what he manages. Okay. This is what it looks like. Thanks, Colleen. Patricia Kirby. Thank you. Patricia Kirby, Don Ladd, and then Ronald Stevens. Good evening. My name is Patricia Kirby, 1111 Spencer Avenue, Clearwater, Florida. I actually live in Clearwater, and I'm coming here to speak on this issue because I care about the land and I care about the people. But the bigger picture is... I was a park ranger, federal park ranger for eight years out west, and each park that I worked at was created by a choice, a choice by the local government, a choice by uh, the state and federal level, and a choice by the local people. 
to create that park and protect that land. We're in a similar situation now, and one of the parks that I worked at, I'm reminded of, this was Zion National Park. I was actually a federal a law enforcement officer in Zion. I answered, I was a dispatcher, answered the 911 calls. Um, and in that particular park, it was almost not a park. They were going to dam the stream further down, ironically, to provide water for golf courses down by Las Vegas. And it would have destroyed the park. It would have flooded the entire park, and there would have been no park. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Zion National Park in Utah. It is absolutely beautiful. I lived there for two years. Gorgeous, gorgeous place. Wonderful energy. And it, it would have been destroyed, and it wouldn't have been there for all of us to enjoy now. So I'm going to keep this short. I think you know my opinion. Uh, I support preserving the land, preserving the waters. And there has been a ton of evidence presented tonight, far more uh, eloquently than I could ever present it. I can only speak from my heart and say that land that is preserved is valued by everyone in perpetuity. And I would love to see that happen with this particular spot of land as well. I would love to see another park created so it, everyone can enjoy it. That's my place. Thank you so much. And I encourage all of you to weigh the evidence and make a decision that's the best one for everybody. God bless you. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, Don Ladd, Ronald Stevens, and Steve Dana Miller. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Don Ladd. I live on 74th Avenue in Seminole, which is in the unincorporated Pinellas County. I really hope that you will listen to the experts you all have hired and put in place that have advised you to turn down this proposed development plan. It is offensive to our sensibilities to even suggest some of the nonsense they have put in front of you today. Because really, most of it is absurd. And somebody did mention credibility. I found it incredibly ridiculous. Some of the things they were saying, they just don't make any sense. Developers don't buy golf courses. They don't, not to run a golf course. I worked for a developer for 25 years. It's not done. We never bought a golf course to run a golf course. So don't be fooled by the nonsense that they are spewing because it is absurd. Your experts have told you to deny it multiple times. You really need to listen. We don't want it. It doesn't make sense. It's illogic. It's impractical. It's idiotic. This is a bad idea. And if you agree with this plan to move forward, you can't come back from it. There's no coming back. It's gone. And then what are you going to do? Sorry. It doesn't work that way. I mean, this is really bad. I hope you will listen to your own experts. Please deny this. Save the tides. You can't come back from a bad mistake. And everyone here has told you, one developer is just trying to line his pockets. I don't feel sorry for him. I'm sorry. I don't feel sorry for him. He made a risky investment. He knew what he was up against. He gambled, and he lost. He just lost. That's the business of development. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. He lost. Please, please deny this application. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, Ronald Stevens, uh, Steve Dana Miller, and then Sarah Tucker. My name is Ronald Stevens. My wife and I live at 6242 Evergreen Avenue in unincorporated Seminole on property that was once adjacent to the 18th tee of the ladies' uh, tee on the golf course. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of Pinellas County, and Mr. Barry Burton. I stand before you today to present the latest, the largest petition, it's the largest petition that Pinellas County has ever received for a land use case. I know you've all received it, but I wanted to see what it looked like. These are seven volumes of books they represent 19,530 signatures of people's voices that are asking you to save our beloved Tides Golf Course Recreation Open Space from utter destruction. We must not let these developers or any developer ever, now or in the future, take this precious recreation open space from our community and our county. 84% of these petition signatures are from Pinellas County citizens and voters. 16% are from visitors to our county. Imagine visitors from all over the world 
have come to our county to play golf at the Tides Golf Course. People from 22 countries around the world and 42 states in the United States have come here. That is how popular our Tides Golf Course recreational open space had been to the outside world and to our community. The Tides is a gem of a property surrounded by over 1,000 homes. Boca Ciega Millennium Park on the west side and the Boca Ciega Intracoastal uh, Waterway on the south side. The original owner, Mr. Mr. Alberting, constructed the Tides so it would serve as a sanctuary for thousands of birds and animals while playing as a golf course built for all ages and all talents. Eagles still call it home. Alligators intrude on it every once in a while. Owls and osprey nest their, nest their young there. Otters actually use it for their playland. Manatees hug its shores in the wintertime. Many different kinds of animals, birds, and mammals depend on the tides for their very survival. And they have for maybe a thousand years or more, but the tides is truly a place to behold and enjoy. But Mr. Hills and Mr. Carpenter and their development plan, Restoration Bay, they want to change all that. They want to destroy all that we love here. They bought the tides to destroy it, never to run it as a golf course. That is not what the developers do. They develop property. They don't run golf courses. Dear commissioners, losing our Tides Golf Course Recreation Open space, space would be akin to carving the heart out of our community. Please do not let this happen. It may never be a golf course again, but it can always remain a recreational open space. We must not let Mr. Hills and Mr. Carpenter be successful with this sham they are trying to perpetrate in our community, which is the utter destruction of this gem that we call our Tides Golf Course recreation open space. Please don't ever let it happen. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you, Ron. I'm going to leave this here. I'll pick okay. them up later. Steve Dannemiller, Sarah Tucker, and then Ed Methvessel. Good evening. My name is Steve Dannemiller. I live on 66th Avenue. My house backs up to the former Tides Golf Course, and I'm here to tell you about one of my neighbors. My neighbor wants a huge favor from you all tonight, but I'm here to let you know what kind of neighbor he has been. So my neighbor originally bought the Tides Golf Course. Why didn't he close it then and go for the land use change right away? Why perpetuate the story that he tried to run it as a profitable business and turn around and repeatedly say golf is a dying industry? My neighbor is a high profile, very experienced developer who seems to know what he is doing, but he underestimated one thing, the deep connection and unwillingness of the community to let the Tides be paved over. This isn't farmland in Hillsborough County that nobody cares about. This is one of the last patches of green space in Pinellas County and as we have shown, we will fight to keep it. My neighbor knew that without community buy-in, he didn't have a chance because the comprehensive plan is definitely not on his side. At first, they tried this community charrette. Actually, I'm gonna go off script here because what they described is highly productive. I sat through these charrettes in the back as an observer, and the only thing memorable I remember is one of their representatives getting into a verbal confrontation, finger pointing, and nearly a fist fight with one of my neighbors. So now, once my neighbor figured out that things were not going his way with the neighborhood, all the goodwill ended. Soon the black construction fence went up, he stopped maintaining the property, and absolutely had to demolish that clubhouse to make a point that development is happening here. So today we're left with an eyesore of a fence, a pile of rubble that was the clubhouse, and a clogged drainage easement that is, isn't being maintained. It almost seems like they want it to flood. As you may or may not know, the Reddington Pier is going through a similar land use request currently. The residents came out in large numbers to fight a zoning change request recently, and there's nothing more telling than the remarks of Commissioner Jenny Blackburn, who said, and I quote, now that the pier is gone, what, that makes it okay to change the zoning? So if I were the owner, all I would have to do is let the pier fall into disrepair to where it had to be torn down, and then it's like, now I get to develop it and make my big payday. Commissioner Blackburn could have not said it better, and they're talking about a small paved lot on Gulf Boulevard and not 100 pristine acres along Boca Ciega Bay. Restoration Bay isn't about protecting the environment. It's about this group getting rich by gambling on a piece of property and betting they could get the land use changed. I'm not buying it, and neither all these green shirts and all these rooms here tonight, and I hope you don't either. Please deny the land use change. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Sarah Tucker. Ed Methvessel and uh, Dr. Ashley Carpenter. 
Good evening, commissioners, and thank you so much for listening to this this evening and all of the work that's been done leading up to this evening. Uh, my name is Sarah Tucker. I live at 5580 Oakhurst Drive. Uh, my property backs up to the submarine uh, underwater area, and I have witnessed all of the wildlife for the last 26 years. But your decision is to determine whether or not this request conflicts with the, with the plan, with the comprehensive plan. And it's clear that it does conflict on multiple points, whether you choose all 35 that were mentioned by one of the prior speakers or any number of them, it's clearly a conflict with the plan. And the other point that's been very well made is once that this land is developed and no longer open, it will never be open again. You cannot turn back if you make the wrong decision. So the decision is clear. You deny the application and you do not send it to the state. You put an end to this. When someone purchases land with a designation, they are not guaranteed that they can change it, especially when their change is detrimental to the community, our infrastructure, the health and safety of all of us that live nearby. Because with those additional people here, who's to say during a given storm or other event that those additional people being in an area that used to be open won't prevent someone from getting help and getting evacuated in a timely manner. So it clearly is a conflict with the plan and on that basis you need to deny the application and I thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Ed um, Methbessel, uh, and you can correct uh, your pronouncing your name, I just, I know I missed that up. Dr. Ashley Carpenter and then Clark Belmonte. Ed, go ahead. I am Ed Methfessel. I reside at 6296 Evergreen Avenue in Seminole. Have lived there for 26 years. Raised a family there with my wife. Um, good evening, Board of Commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. It is unfortunate this, appli this application has taken so much of your time and resources, but I sincerely appreciate the process provided to myself, the community, as well as the applicant. I won't comment on the specifics of the case, but rather just state a few of my opinions. It is well documented that many golf courses have closed in Florida, and the property is mostly purchased by developers. Smart developers have aggressively sought opportunities like this. I am insulted that the owner of the Tides wants, wants me to believe that he is truly interested in running a golf course. Quality of life is important to me and my family, which is why we live in Pinellas County, and specifically Seminole. In our effort to save this property, myself and approximately 19,000 people signed a petition to preserve this property as green space. I am told 19,000 people is the, is the largest petition Pinellas County officials have ever seen. It's ironic that I too am in the construction business along with the applicant. I too stand to make money from this construction. However, I choose quality of life over money. Rather than build upon the remaining green space in Pinellas, I am supportive of redevelopment to improve the community. The current comprehensive plan recognizes Pinellas is almost built out and, and it's important to preserve green space. The Tides property is zoned recreation, open space, and the applicant knew that before purchasing the property. I feel they also knew about the previous attempts to rezone as well. Three previous times, your county staff has reviewed other applications and have consistently recommended against rezoning this property. Just last month, the LPA group unanimously voted to deny the application to, the re to rezone the property. In essence, your, e your experts have advised you. Additionally, the wishes of approximately 19,000 people have asked you to protect this property. I urge you to support your staff report and LPA decision and protect this property for future generations to enjoy. Pinellas County will never have an opportunity to have a green space this unique. You must protect it. I honestly believe years from now you will be revered for your decision to protect this land. In closing, thank you for your leadership and sacrifices you make in an effort to maintain Pinellas County as a beautiful place to live and visit. Thank you, Ed. Dr. Ashley Carpenter, and then Clark Belmonte, and then Andy Strickland.
Hello, I'm Dr. Ashley Carpenter on 6200 Evergreen Avenue, and I moved to the Tides neighborhood because I fell in love with the amount of open green space in the area. I found it so beautiful and relaxing, especially after some stressful shifts. I can really appreciate the green space now and how limited it is and how we need to save it. I know that being in this neighborhood cost extra, but I felt it was worth the benefit of being near this green open space. I wanted to bring up that in 2020, the Environmental and Natural Resource Committee put aside $10 million a year from Forever Florida to buy land for conservation easement that could serve as a hurricane recovery strategy and make our area more resilient after hurricanes. <clears throat> The focus of this money is for coastal areas just like the tides land. This money can be used to develop a better stormwater treatment strategy for this area. We do not need a builder to do it for us. The county has the opportunity to use state funds to buy and preserve this land as well as fix the stormwater treatment issues. The former Bay Point golf course was denied land zone changes too and the land was turned into a storm water management area. The tides land can also follow this pattern and be preserved. My wish would be to have the land used for a park. This would not only benefit the people living here, but also all the animals that currently call it a home. I'm asking the commissioners to please save this last bit of open green space. If you are considering siding with the greedy builder, then I ask you, what would it take for you to side to side with your constituents and the environment, what would it take? I also wanna thank everyone that spoke tonight. They did a lot of research and made a lot of valid points and I thank you all for your hard work. The community stands out as one and we wanna save the tides, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carpenter. Okay, Clark Bamonte, Andy Strickland and then Elizabeth Kelzer. Well, um, I came here, I had written down a whole bunch of stuff. But Clark, to, just uh, your address for the record, please. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Clark Bomani, uh, 12155 70th Avenue in Seminole. Thank you. Um, I live in the neighborhood directly adjacent to the, the uh, proposed development, the former Tides Golf Course. Um, we have 273 homes in there. Every one of those homes uses 66th Avenue as the main High, uh, roadway into our community. We have, um, you know, it's 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 a normal neighborhood road. It doesn't. It's not big. It turns into a one-lane street pretty much throughout the day as Amazon trucks stop, lawn service trucks stop, people park on the road. This is the main road. This is the one that that the developer is saying it's perfect for 3,000 trips a day. We already have 300 homes using it now. And he's proposing to put nearly 300 more on there. And it's just not, it's the, home, it's the road in front of your house, all right? Would you want 300 additional homes worth of traffic in front of your house? You know, there's, th th this property is landlocked behind these pre-existing neighborhoods. If this man wanted to develop, he should have been here 30, 40 years ago. But he wasn't. He's here today. <laughs> Times have changed. So, you know, I, I can't really add more to what all everybody else said. Um, they did a great job. The county staff has done a phenomenal job, um, you know, holding him accountable to the plan. And I think we all should, um, you know, consider that. And I hope um, that you all vote to deny this and uh, now and in the future because they will be back, I'm sure, but uh, they'll also meet the same opposition that they're meeting today. Um, I'll keep it short. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Clark. Andy Strickland, Elizabeth Kelzer, Mary Ellen Hazelden. Good evening, everybody. Um, Andy, thank you. Andy Strickland, 5850 Oakhurst Drive in Seminole. 
Um, yeah, I'd like to thank the applicant, ac actually. Um, I've been involved in Save the Tides. I was a founding member since 2012. I'd like to thank the applicant, because if it wasn't for the applicant, I have not, would not have had such a good opportunity to, uh, to meet good people, people that are interested in fighting for their community, people that on the weekends and weeknights are out pounding doors, uh, walking the streets, um, people that are spending their own money, especially if they're on fixed incomes, to pay for attorney's fees, buying signs, organizing debates, social media, um, present uh, protests on uh, Park Boulevard, you name it, we've done it. And I appreciate the uh, applicant for allowing me to get to know my neighbors and, and to know people who care about this community because these people are not doing it for themselves, they're doing it for the community, which means they're doing it for all of you. So um, I've heard a lot of talk tonight about uh, the golf course. Well, the first year of law school, we're told that if you don't have the, f if you have the facts, pound the facts. If you have the law, pound the law. If you don't have either, pound the table. And I respectfully submit to the applicant, uh, especially as attorney, that there's been a lot of table pounding tonight. You know, on the uh, press release dated uh, 2018, when the tides closed, the tide states, or the owner of the tide states, that uh, the tides is closing because it doesn't have the support of the community. Look around. I don't know what happened to that big stack of papers. The tides had the support of the community, but one thing it didn't have is the support of the owner. Because shortly after the golf course was purchased by the applicant, this anonymous letter was passed out that I would like to have submitted to the record. And this anonymous letter states that the golf course was purchased, quote, well, I'll read it. The plan is to shut down the golf course in spring, May of 2017, and sell the property to residential developers. The residents of the golf course of the community need to know, anonymous. This was passed out by people right after they purchased the golf course. So the golf course had the support of the uh, community, it just didn't have the support of the owner. And then secondly, if this golf course was so unable to be financially viable, why then, and this needs to be put in a record too, the charrette process, okay? If the golf course is not viable as a golf course, then why during the charrette process did they suggest, right here in the middle of it, golf course, 19-hole golf course? So I don't know what you like me to do with these, but... This needs to get in the record. Thank to you. The, uh, clerk over here. Thank you. Elizabeth Kelzer, we have uh, six folks left. Elizabeth Kelzer, Mary, El Mary Ellen Hazelden, and Vic Stevens. Hi, good evening. I'm a little nervous. It's okay, it's relax. First time We're doing something. Here. Thank you for being here. I'm Elizabeth Kelzer. I live at 6719 121st Street in Seminole. I did go to the last LPA meeting, and at that vote, Ms. John happened to mention that if the owner satisfied two questions, she would move to approve the request. Interestingly enough, I read all of the county documents, and I was unable to locate anything in the land planning documents that says the LPA must approve a land change designation if the owner meets certain criteria. Also, from Ms. John's website, it appears that changing the county's plan was her top priority. However, purchasing recreational land and then complaining that you can't put a house on it is like buying a boat and then complaining that I can't drive it on the road. I heard the owner's lawyer complain at the last meeting that the board continues to deny because it wants the board to buy the property and you're trying to drive the price down. If the owner did not want recreational land, they should not have purchased recreational land. You owe him nothing and you need not contribute to his avarice. You owe those of us who live in unincorporated Pinellas County the right to continue to live near the peace and recreational land that we paid additional money for to purchase. You need to uphold your land objectives 1.4 to protect your open spaces. The current owner is a gambling man for sure. He is gambling that you will let him drive his boat down the road. Don't let him. He tells tall tales when he says that the golf course was not viable. 
I pass that course daily for work. I have lived there since 2004. It was always busy. The parking lot was always full. I'm not sure when he purchased the golf carts, carts but it did seem like he shut down right before his season was going to start. I don't believe golfing is going away as, the, as a sport as he claims. Our high schools still have golf teams. My son was on one. And you know what? They used to use the tides to practice. Now they can't. This property is an extension of the park. It's in the 100-year floodplain. It is deemed recreational. And we know that Pinellas County is too populated as it is right now. Objective 1.5 specifically encourages you to deny his petition. It says that you will prohibit the conversion of dedicated recreational open space land and encourage the retention of non-dedicated recreational open space land. Deny his change, his request to change the land designation for the Tides Country Club. Show your citizens that the objectives of Pinellas County are not written down just to be changed if you have an abundance of money. I don't live on that golf course, but I do live nearby. Please check your email for the pictures I sent you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Mary Ellen Hazelden and Vic Stevens, and then uh, Kat will go to you for uh, three names. Hi, I'm Mary Ellen Hazelden, and I live at, my husband and I live at 12050 66th Avenue North, Sentinel, Florida. Good evening. Thank you so much for this time to speak. The Tides is wisely designated recreational open space. The health benefits of maintaining this open space, which have been further emphasized by the impact of COVID-19, include, but are not limited to, increased air quality, reduced noise pollution, prevention of added traffic congestion, and it can provide recreational and social opportunities, all of which can reduce stress and enhance wellness. Overwhelmingly, objectives and policies of both the Pinellas County Strategic Plan and Comprehensive Plan provide the foundation for voting no. To build upon this, Pinellas County's website offers extensive resources and links concerning flood risks. Pinellas County's Natural Disaster Mitigation Plan supports a no vote. In part, it states, quote, most of the burdens of recovering from a disaster are borne by local governments. Such disasters can bring extraordinary hardships to citizens, devastate the economic base, and diminish its quality of life for years to come, unquote. By voting to deny the tides, the, to not, to, excuse me, by voting to deny development on the tides, you can eliminate or minimize impact of disasters that could threaten this land and the surrounding neighborhoods and prevent the need for Blue Acres programs as required in New York and New Jersey following Hurricane Sandy and a similar program in Texas following Hurricane Ike. After hu Hurricane Sandy, FEMA notes that in New Jersey, the state would purchase 1,300 properties in flood zone property, flood prone pro communities through its Blue Acres acquisition program to dr dramatically reduce the risk of future catastrophic flood damage and to move families out of harm's way. These programs took years and hundreds of millions of tax dollars to take developed area and return it back to open space. Ultimately, the homes in these states were, to quote from FEMA's site, demolished and preserved in perpetuity as open space to serve as a natural buffer against future storms and floods, unquote. This could have been prevented. The decision tonight will have a profound impact on our community and county. The county staff and the LPA board's recommendation of denial align with over 19,000 signatures reflecting our county citizens and seasonal visitors. For all these reasons and so much more, please vote no. Thank you so much for all your time this evening. My apologies for being so nervous. Thank That's you so okay. much. That's great, Mary Ellen. Thank you. Uh, Vic Stevens will be the last speaker in the House, and then we have three speakers uh, that have registered to be on uh, from online. Good evening. My name is Vic Stevens. My address is 11572 62nd Avenue, Seminole, Florida. The owner bought the golf course for $3.8 million, but the value of the property is only $1.9. $3.8 million, but the value is only $1.9. There, there were offers previously to buy the golf course to keep it a golf course 
but the bank, Wells Fargo, wouldn't sell it to anybody else to keep it a golf course. They, Wells Fargo, were only going to sell it to developer. The same thing happened two years ago previously with Taylor Morrison, another developer. Why would anyone planning on keeping it a golf course pay double the property value? Simple. Their plan was to develop the property. Their plan was to develop the property. They have no golf course experience. I grew up on the tides. Oh, the owners knew from the beginning it was zoned recreation open space. They were betting, they were betting that they could change the zoning. I grew up on the tides since I was 12 years old. I worked on the tides for 15 years, from 1982 to 1996. And then again from 2016 to 2017. I was working on the tides when they bought it. I've seen millions of golfers enjoy this golf course. When the owners bought the property, they never introduced themselves to myself or any of the other employees. My son was working there as well. Never any, never any introduction. Why? Because they didn't have any plans to keep it a golf course or improve it as a golf course. All the things they said, said they did was such, to, to imp, all the things they said to implement or improve the golf course was already being done. The leagues, the restaurant, all those things. Dan Hot, myself, everybody else that was working there, it was already being done. These guys didn't bring any of that to the golf course. That was all for show. And, that, and when they bought the golf carts, that was just to spend their profit or their so-called profit so they could show they weren't making money. They were acting like they were investing to show they had a loss. They raised great green fees. They didn't provide the right maintenance budget to maintain the plush quality golf course in an effort to turn golfers away and, and try to deter play. Instead, the members and guests from all over the U.S. continue to play. 30 to 40 plus thousand golfers a year. 30 to 40,000 rounds. I saw the men's leagues, the ladies' leagues, the afternoon leagues, the weekend leagues, the daily golfers, tournaments throughout the year. They were coming nonstop. They couldn't run it into the ground enough to stop people from playing. So I knew all these people personally. I encourage you to get the facts about the golf course in a management company. I think you'll find a story of success, thousands of rounds of play, and profitability. Since they couldn't deter play, they blamed on Hurricane Irma. So let's close it because we weren't making money. Yeah, enough, not enough, then they had enough money to tear down the golf course or the clubhouse, right? If you had enough money to do that, invest it in the golf course. Ladies and gentlemen, take it from someone who's worked on the tides, played on the tides for over 20 plus years. The tides is a viable golf course. Developers know he bought a property zoned recreation open space. Hold them accountable to that. This shows July 1st when they closed the golf course, they already had 25,000 rounds halfway through the year. If they would have finished, it would have been 60,000 rounds of golf in one year. Thanks, Vic. 60,000. Yeah. Thanks, Vic. Okay, Kat, um, you have three that have registered for uh, on, online using Zoom. Go ahead. Yes, Mr. Chair. The first person who registered online is Ms. Beth Hovind. Ms. Hovind, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone to speak on this item. And again, Ms. Beth Hovind, if you have joined us today, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone. It does not appear that Ms. Hovind has joined us. So I'm gonna move on to our next speaker. It's Mr. Thomas uh, Beckwith. Mr. Beckwith, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application. All right, and once you're unmuted, sir, if you could state and spell your name for the record, state your address, you will have three minutes, sir. Thomas Beckwith, 5728 Poker Drive, Terminal, Florida. When the Beckwith family decided to move Beckwith Electric Company down to Pinellas County back in 1973 and bought the family home across the bayou from the Tides Golf Club, we thought we were just about the luckiest people in the world. And over the years, as we grew to love this area more and more, as God prospered our company, we were encouraged by some of the most supportive city and county officials we could ever imagine. Folks like Bill Castoro of the Pinellas County Development Council, County Commissioners Chuck Rainey and Barbara Sheen Todd, Gabe Cazares, Mayor of Clearwater, they all took a personal interest in creating and preserving a stellar living environment for our employees. But our recent long fight to save the tides really opened my eyes as to the present state of affairs in Pinellas County. With no advance warning, we were notified that the Tides Golf Club, founded in 73, would be closing operations effective July 2018 and that they would secure the perimeter. For the many residents on the fairway, the prospect of now looking at a chain link fence was devastating. Back in 2012, we fought to the, the attempt to rezone the tides with demonstrations, massive email campaigns, meetings with the county commissioners, and a petition with over 19,000 signatures. The final scheduled LPA meeting in January 24 had to be moved to the St. Pete College Seminole Auditorium 
to hold the 500 plus citizens who plan to attend to fight the rezoning. The morning of that hearing, the LPA recommendation to the board of county commissioners was released, advising that rezoning be denied. Taylor Morrison withdrew their rezoning application. The hearing was canceled. Hey, you know, we thought we'd want to maintain the longstanding unanimous 1985 county commissioner's designation of recreational open space in the land use plan. Much of the times it's immediately adjacent to and submerged within Boca Ciega Bay and meets the definition of aquatic land. This property was offered maximum protection from development due to its environmental sensitivity and the value to the sustainability of the county. But in 2016, this Tampa developer purchased the property with full knowledge of the above denial. From 2014 to 16, before he bought it, with the threat of rezoning removed, the Rowlands plate had increased 36%, but then in 2017 with a new owner, clients saw conditions deteriorate rapidly. This developer bought it with eyes wide open. The residential zoning had been vacated years before by the owner. And after decades of precedent, three rejections, a community and thousands of petitions against him, and a comp plan that he seriously violates, what was he thinking? Recreational open space rules, no development, end of story. So let this be the final battle. Please reject. Thank you, Thomas. And Mr. Chair, our last speaker is Maria Beckwith. It appears she's at the same address, but Ms. Beckwith, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine on your telephone to speak on this item. And then once you are unmuted, if you could state, spell your name for the record, state your address, you will have three minutes, ma'am. We registered to time, but we couldn't figure out how to do it at the beginning, and so she's gone. She's not on, okay, thank you. That is it, Mr. That's Chair. all we have. Okay, so thank you. We've we've heard from um, residents. Um, we've heard from the two applicants the, and the residents and their their representatives. Um, Charlie, how much time does the uh, applicant? One minute. Oh, you already have it up there. Thank you. Um, you have a minute and ten seconds, uh, Joe. Joel, if you would like to uh, have a rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. $23 got you a golf cart, a beer, and a hot dog with your round of golf. That's how aggressive they got in the marketing to try to make it mark go. You can't, those you play golf, can't make a living doing that. Many of the residents ask you repeatedly to, quote, preserve the land for the public good, close quote, preserve as green space, close quote. Recreation open space can be translated as public park. That's really what your recreation open space is. And I submit that you commissioners know very well how you legally create a public park, how you legally preserve green space, and how you preserve the land for the public good, and that is you acquire the property as a public park using taxpayer dollars. So if you believe these 20,000 people are correct, that that is a legitimate goal for the county to pursue, that's the goal you should be pursuing. It is not appropriate, though, to use the land use regulations to deny a legitimate use. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Okay, and staff um, has uh, some time as well. So if staff can come forward, how much time do they have, Charo? 19 minutes. 19 minutes. Good evening once again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, pr I promise I'm not going to use uh, the entire 19 minutes uh, for our summary, but I do think it's important that we hit a few points as we close and as we move closer uh, to a vote on this application. And I'd like to recognize um, the public sentiment that we've heard. Uh, we've heard a number of people from the public and we've heard um, their representatives as well. Some very passionate pleas uh, people are truly passionate about this area, about this property. Um, we've heard a lot of concerns. Um, we've heard even some proposals on how to handle this property. And I know I speak um, on behalf of my own uh, group of colleagues and staff at the county when I say that we hear you, we're listening to you, 
and we care about what you have to say. And I, and, and I can't imagine that the board doesn't feel the same way. But now that we've, now that we've um, gone past our public comment period, I really want to try and redirect us and to focus us back to the application at hand and the review of the application. Our review, this application is for a future land use map designation change on a 96 acre subject property in unincorporated county. And as staff, our responsibility is to review this proposal on the subject property based on goals, objectives, and policies within the comprehensive plan. And then to bring about findings and a recommendation for you as to whether or not we feel that there is consistency and compliance overall and on balance with our goals, objectives, and policies in the comprehensive plan. And that is the limitation of this review. I've heard some suggestions and I think even more poignant um, accusations that staff is looking to or suggesting or even saying that development on this property should be prohibited. And we're not saying that. That's not in your staff report. And we haven't said that. And I almost find such a suggestion of saying something like that based on the review before us, I find it almost um, not to be even germane to what we're looking at. We're reviewing the proposal before us. It is a land use change from recreation, open space, and preservation on 96 acres to 89 acres of residential low and the balance of seven acres of preservation. And, we're re and that's it. That's what we're reviewing. We're not reviewing whether or not development would work, maybe what, what kind of development would work. We're reviewing the application for the subject property based on the comprehensive plan period. That's what we're doing. This is the application before us tonight. And this is how we review these comprehensive plan amendment applications. <clears throat> so I just, want to, I just want to make that clear as we're moving forward and we're considering you know, what to do now. Um, I do, I think it's important just to take a couple minutes and to clarify um, density, how density works in our county and how density works in the state of Florida. Density comes from future land use, future land use map designations. That is where density is derived. This isn't just what the county does, this is statutory. Our state requires this and we need to be in compliance with our state requirements. That's how we calculate density. That's how we determine density in this county. We don't do it by zoning, current zoning. We don't do it by permitted lot sizes or minimum lot sizes. We don't do it by former zoning districts or expired plats or anything like that. Density does not come from zoning in Pinellas County. It comes from the future land use map designation. The future land use map designation is preservation and recreation open space, which does not permit residential and thus does not have a residential density application. There are zero residential entitlements on this property currently. And again, as I mentioned earlier, that's, that's our baseline of where we're beginning with this. And so during our review and during um, my portion of the presentation earlier, um, I felt important that we really kind of hit the highlights of the issues that we found with this application as it applies to the subject property. And it's all of those highly vulnerable areas of the subject property, which are located you know, primarily to the south and the southwest. And so we went through and we learned first what, how, how, you know, we've looked at our comp plan. Our comp plan speaks to these issues. It gives us direction and guidance. And so we laid out what does our comp plan say? And then we looked at, well, how does it apply to the subject property in light of what is being proposed? Where is, res where is a residential designation that has never existed on this property in the 46 years we've had the land use? When is the recreational space land use? When this is being proposed in these vulnerable areas, just carte blanche, 89 acres, it, it all bleeds into those areas of high vulnerability. 
And that's where the crux of many of our uh, findings and recommendations for and our review of this come from. It comes from those comp, those comp plan goals, objectives, and policies where we see a lot of red flags based on the application that's before us. And so overall, you know, when we're looking at consistency and compliance with our comp plan, staff finds on balance that this proposal does not adequately address the vulnerable areas of the subject property. And our comp plan pays a lot of attention to vulnerable areas and gives us good direction of how to handle this. And that's what we base our, our findings and our recommendations on. And so as I close, I will just reiterate that staff recommends that the Board of County Commissioners deny this application as on balance it is not compliant nor consistent with our comprehensive plan on balance. I thank you for your time, and I believe we're, we're I'm done with our summaries. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, before we uh, get to commissioners' questions and deliberation, um, I wanted to ask Jewel if you would kind of get us back uh, to where we need to be for this discussion based on some of the comments that were made by the applicant. Uh, sure, if I could. There's a, a number of points that I did want to address. Uh, and let me start with the nature of this hearing. This is a legislative hearing. You are making a decision as to whether the application to amend the land use plan from recreation and open space and preservation to residential low and preservation is consistent with your comprehensive plan. Florida law recognizes an application to amend nearly 100 acres of land on your future land use map as legislative in nature. Um, there was an assertion that your staff can't have it both ways. They can't rely on the details included in the zoning development agreement and development master plan application to conduct their analysis as to the land use amendment. But if you look at your staff report that has for your hearing tonight, and as you listened to your staff presentation for your hearing this evening, those details were not part of either the report or the presentation. Uh, we heard a reference to some specifics from the applicant, uh, a reference to 3.1 dwelling units an acre. Your staff did not look at that. Your staff gave no consideration to that whatsoever because that's what you would hear later on this fall. Uh, in fact, the only real reference that you heard of any specifics was that, generally speaking, the proposal was for a 273 unit residential development. And that was really it. So again, what you're looking at this evening is whether you believe modifying your land use plan to allow five units an acre under your residential low land use plan on about 89 out of these 96 acres is consistent with your plan. Uh, one other thing I will mention in this regard, Commissioner Long asked earlier about some of the ingress and egress to this property and why she hadn't heard any discussion of that. That's not an issue that you would get into at this phase. That's more relevant for a zoning application a development agreement application and a development master plan application. And those issues will in fact be taken up at that phase of this proceeding. What you see in your staff report before you tonight are traffic counts. The traffic that would be intended to be generated were this change to be made to residential low. You're not gonna get into specifics like ingress and egress at this phase. And in fact, your staff did not do that. A couple of other things that came up. Uh, we heard discussion about the uh, zoning change back in 1985. Uh, and I will admit, Mr. Bulvis, I think, made this point ahead of me, but I'm going to reiterate it. Um, back then, we heard that the owner was told that when the property was rezoned, they could come back and apply for a change in zoning. There was no representation that, that that change in zoning back to what it was previously or even back to some other category would be granted as a matter of right. And in fact, you didn't hear that because that is not legally possible. That commission back in 1985 would have had no legal right to tell an owner that they could automatically have some form of zoning back, which is in fact why you heard that that commission told the then owner that they would be able to apply for the zoning.
So some other things that you heard this evening. Staff has never come here and told you that conversion from recreation open space is prohibited by your plan. What they told you and cited to was a policy in your plan that encourages preservation of recre open, recreation and open space when it is non-dedicated, which is what you have before you this evening. What staff is telling you is that in their professional opinion, this application before you tonight for a change in land use to residential low is not consistent with your comprehensive plan. Likewise, staff has never said that this property has to be maintained as a golf course and that what I heard characterized as a failing business would have to be maintained on the property as well. Again, staff has told you that in their professional opinion, they do not deem this application consistent with your comp plan. Another claim that I heard this evening is that you should not be balancing the policies and objectives of your comprehensive plan when there is one that is so clear that you have no discretion, that policy being your policy in 1.3.5 that talks about a five unit an acre threshold. What your plan says is that you are prohibited from amending your plan to grant any density in a, in a residential category beyond five units an acre. That's a hard stop. That is not an automatic grant of that density up to five units an acre. So that is not something that is granted as a matter of right. And in fact, if that were the case, that would really render all the other policies and objectives in your comprehensive plan irrelevant. And that is just not the case. What your job here tonight is to do is to look at all the comprehensive plan policies that you've heard about, and that could be from your staff, that could be from all the other experts that you heard here this evening, and for you to make a determination as to whether you think this plan or this proposal, which seeks to modify 89 out of 96 acres to residential low, and at the risk of sounding unpopular or saying something unpopular, let me say, your decision here tonight is not about whether you are saving the tides. It is not about whether or you are deciding that there will be a golf course on this property. This is not about whether you believe or are offended at the notion of a developer making money. Your decision here is plain and simple. Do you believe that on balance, the proposal to amend the recreation and open space and preservation to residential low and preservation, whether you believe that that is consistent with your comprehensive plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay, um, we have staff available here if we have questions. Um, I'll open it up to the commissioners for questions, conversation, motions, whatever the will of the commission is. Commissioner Gerard. Well, I'll just jump right in there. Um, you know, many of the issues that we deal with here have to do with <laughs> prior planning in this county or lack thereof. You know, when I hear they were talking about the surrounding neighborhoods and um, and and the 1926 plat with a 273 lots. That, first place, it's almost 100 years ago, and we we look very differently at our uh, at our county and our responsibilities to the environment than we did 100 years ago, um, and we look and we attempt to look into the future and see what it is. That we're, <laughs> that we're creating as we make decisions on a daily basis. And the things that we deal with now, things like transport, <laughs> transportation and traffic, stormwater, sewers, streets and sidewalks and all that, we are playing catch up. We've been playing catch up for 50 years in Pinellas County and we'll continue to do that for the next 50 years. But I don't think, I, when I was a brand new commissioner in the city of Largo, we had a 
a local environmentalist who used to come and talk to us every week. And uh, he had very strong opinions about things. And one day he was giving us a hard time about um, planting trees too close to the sidewalk. That was a popular theme. And he said, future generations will spit on your graves. And as a new commissioner, I went, oh my God. But I have never forgotten that. You know, I mean, under the circumstances, it might have been a little harsh, but I've not forgotten my responsibility to this county and, and the decisions that I make. So I am um, not inclined to approve this change, particularly when it's in direct conflict with our comprehensive plan. Uh, so that's my opinion. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Flowers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to, um, I just want to make sure that I'm correct um, in my um, understanding. Um, the 273 lots, this is for Jewel. Um, the 273 lots that were platted, platted back in 1926 were vacated in 1992, which means they don't exist anymore. That, that plat doesn't exist anymore. Um, so when that happens, it doesn't exist. There's not 273 lots anymore because that was given up. Although it may not have been by the current owner, that was given up. So what is, is, is that an accurate that, that is accurate. That is accurate. And at the time, the uh, plat was vacated by the then current owner. And what that essentially means is that any entitlement to those 273 units based upon the plat was extinguished. Okay. Um, I want to thank um, everyone here today that made their presentations. I thought that, you know, I know this is a, a very charged issue um, because of everyone's sense or feeling. Uh, regarding this. So I want to thank staff for, um, I think, what was a very well laid out presentation. I want to thank uh, representation on both sides for stating your your case eloquently. And I want to thank the residents who have come out and who have done what you're supposed to do, um, being consistent in sharing the points related to um, your sense of your understanding of what we're here for on today. And based on um, what has been shared by staff and based on the evidence that is presented, um, at this time I would move that we um, uphold staff's recommendation and deny moving forward uh, with this based on its noncompliance and non-consistency. Second. Okay, did you have a, you had raised your hand for comment? I raised my hand to make a motion. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Commissioner Seal. I just want to um, make a comment, and it's been said, but I do want to emphasize that we are looking at the future land use plan for consistency and compliance with the comprehensive plan of Pinellas County. Staff is not saying it can't be developed, but what they're saying is that the intensity of the level of the proposed development, there's, it's not restricted nor, it directs, nor does it direct the intensity or the density away from vulnerable areas. So they talked about the floodplain, they talked about the coastal storm area and storm surge, and this particular um, development does not satisfy that, and it is inconsistent with our comprehensive plan. And I just wanted that in the record. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, just a few questions and, and a couple statements that I would like to make in the spirit of full disclosure, because I found some of the testimony this evening almost incredulous and um, quite unbelievable. As a member of Blessed Sacrament Parish since 1972, for anybody that's counting, that's 49 years, I don't uh, know uh, what kind of study was conducted for traffic counts, but 
if you're trying to take a child, and all three of my children have attended Blessed Sacrament School, and I am an active parishioner, and it's a very active parish, and I don't know how you attend anything there uh, in the morning, during the day, after school, or on the weekends, because they have a very uh, proactive sports program at Blessed Sacrament. There's a lot of activities for the adults and for the parish. There's an annual carnival every year. And my goodness, the backup of traffic just trying to drop your children off at school is unbelievable. And coming down 113th Street, as you get close to making that right turn to, to go up, up there to the, to, the, to the church or the school, which is just down the street from the tides. I mean, there is a wait, and you can go through four or five traffic lights before you can get through that intersection. So I know that's not our issue tonight, but it is certainly in our long-range plan, number one. And number two, I think it's important for the citizens to know that every single year, the commission spends a lot of time on our strategic plan. And we update our strategic plan every single year. There were several of us this year who really advocated to put climate change, sea level rise, resiliency, and sustainability in our strategic plan. And I, for one, am elated to see that the staff has responded to that in the way that they have and spoke to it in their summary and in their recommendations. So I can certainly not agree to move this forward this evening. This proposed project is in no manner, shape, or form consistent in my mind for all the reasons that have been stated this evening. And lastly, I couldn't agree with Commissioner Flowers more in her speaking to the professionalism and the courtesy and the depth of information provided on both sides of the team that presented us tonight. This is hours and hours and hours of work and real public service dedication to trying to help us make a very thoughtful and profound decision that uh, affects so many of our citizens, our homeowners, and our families. And I do think that this has been a great example of how citizens can rally and really make a difference in a, in a positive way. So I thank you all for that as well and for your courtesy and the respect that you have shown this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other, any other thoughts or comments? Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'll just echo what I've heard already tonight, uh, thanking everyone for being here tonight, uh, for uh, Mr. Tu representing your, your applicant, your client, uh, for our staff, the professional work in the background. Uh, this has been a long time coming to get to this point of, of uh, a decision point. Uh, thank Jewel and her team. And, and the, um, the end summary of how you presented it was really helpful in clarifying where we are and the decision point. So I thank you for that. And um, I couldn't agree more with Commissioner Flowers and how she stated the motion. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. And um, yeah, my comments really aren't much different. Uh, first of all, I too wanted to thank the applicant. I wanted to thank the, our staff, our, our legal counsel. And I also wanted to thank the residents for their ongoing efforts to preserve a community. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it doesn't, it's not lost on any of us, the amount of energy and time and passion that you all have used over the decades, if not years, certainly. Uh, for preservation of a community that means uh, so much to you. Um, you know, whether the community um, has expectations when they moved into the area for having a golf course, whether that's right or not, I don't know. But I certainly know a lot of people that have moved on to golf courses and have had them, uh, have, have been changed. And uh, that's, that's, that's been a shame for the people that invested dollars for that. Recreation open space, um, 
um, that, that was purported to uh, to have uh, the golf course piece of that has, was purported to have failed. I'm not sure that 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 was proven at all, or that that was even an issue that we needed to look at. Um, 1985, like like the like the attorney said, they gave no guarantees or anything; just gave the right to reapply. Um, and certainly, the expectation after buying the property based on other other lesser projects that were rejected certainly doesn't give credence to that. But more importantly than anything is I think that the project itself, and I think that's the important thing tonight, has been deemed to be inconsistent and non-compliant with our comp plan on so many levels. And I think really that is at the heart of it. And whether it's a point or two, there's 35 points here. And on balance, I think that's the point that's been made tonight by our staff, by our residents. And so I would uh, also support the motion. Um, I don't see any other comments from commissioners. I don't see any other comments from staff. I have a motion for denial, uh, denying the transmittal, accepting staff's recommendation, however it wants to be said. I've got a second on that. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. This has been denied. We do not have an item three tonight. Mr. Chair, real quick for oh. the record, um, who was the second on that motion? I had Commissioner Flowers as Commissioner the Commissioner Peters. Commissioner Peters, thank you. Commissioner, uh, excuse me, uh, Jewel, did you have anything to add? Sorry. Um, the other thing I would add at this point is um, you do have agenda item number 35, which is the Brownfields application. However, at this point, as you have denied the land use amendment, um, in my opinion, that application has been rendered moot because one of the criteria that the applicant would have to meet is that they are consistent with the zoning and land use, which you have just denied. So it is a legal impossibility at this point for them to meet that criteria. So in my opinion, that application has been rendered moot. Okay. So we, uh, we will not have the third case tonight uh, based on that. Any final comments from the commission? I really appreciate your all's efforts too. I mean, because it, it was a lot of a lot of things to get through and a lot of information, and really appreciate your all's efforts as well. Yes. In all my years on the commission, I don't think I've ever had anything come before me that's had as many attachments to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, probably a little bit of a reflection on what the community's been through for the last few years. Seriously. Uh, this uh, this meeting is adjourned. Seriously.